The following is a conversation with Dmitry Dolgov, the CTO of Waymo, which is an autonomous driving company that started as Google self-driving car project in 2009 and became Waymo in 2016. Dmitry was there all along. Waymo is currently leading in the fully autonomous vehicle space in that they actually have an at-scale deployment of publicly accessible autonomous vehicles driving passengers around with no safety driver with nobody in the driver's seat. This to me is an incredible accomplishment of engineering on one of the most difficult and exciting artificial intelligence challenges of the 21st century. Quick mention of each sponsor followed by some thoughts related to the episode. Thank you to Trial Labs, a company that helps businesses apply machine learning to solve real world problems. Blinkist, an app I use for reading through summaries of books, BetterHelp, online therapy with a licensed professional, and Cash App, the app I use to send money to friends. Please check out the sponsors in the description to get a discount and to support this podcast. As a side note, let me say that autonomous and semi-autonomous driving was the focus of my work at MIT and is a problem space that I find fascinating and full of open questions from both a robotics and a human psychology perspective. There's quite a bit that I could say here about my experiences in academia on this topic that revealed to me, let's say, the less admirable sides of human beings. But I choose to focus on the positive, on solutions, on brilliant engineers like Dmitri and the team at Waymo, who work tirelessly to innovate and to build amazing technology that will define our future. Because of Dmitri and others like him, I'm excited for this future. And who knows, perhaps I too will help contribute something of value to it. If you enjoy this thing, subscribe on YouTube, review it with five stars on Apple Podcast, follow on Spotify, support on Patreon, or connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. And now, here's my conversation with Dmitry Dolgov. When did you first fall in love with robotics or even computer science more in general? Computer science first at a fairly young age. Robotics happened much later. Um, I uh, I think my first interesting introduction to computers was in the late 80s uh, when we got our first computer. I think it was an, uh, an IBM, I think IBM AT. I think, do you remember those things that had like a turbo button in the front? Turbo that, button, that, yeah. You would press it and you know, make, make the thing go faster. Did they already have floppy disks? Yeah, 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 the, like the, the five, Point four inch ones. Yeah, I think there was a bigger inch. So good when something then five inches and three inches. Yeah, I think that was the five. I don't. I maybe that was before that was the, the giant plates. Then I didn't get that. Uh, but it was definitely not the not the three inch ones. Uh, anyway, so that that you know we got that uh, computer. I spent the first uh, few months just you know playing video games uh, as you would expect. I uh, got bored of that, uh, so I uh, started messing around and uh, trying to figure out how to you know, make the thing do other stuff. Got into uh, exploring you know, programming, and a couple of years later, I got to a point where um, I actually wrote a game, uh, a, a little game, nice. and a game developer, uh, a Japanese game developer, actually offered to buy it for me for you know a few hundred bucks, but you know for for a kid. Uh, in Russia. It's a big uh, deal. It's a big deal, yeah. Uh, I did not take the deal. Wow, integrity. Yeah, uh, I, I instead... I, stupidity. Yes, that was not the most acute financial move that I made in my life, you know, looking back at it now. Uh, I, I instead put it, well, you know, I, I had a reason. I, I put it online. Uh, mm -hmm. It was, what what you call it back in the days? It was a freeware, I think, right? It was not open source, but you could upload the binaries, you would put the game online, and the idea was that, you know, people like it, and then they, you know, contribute and they send you little donations, right? So I did my quick math of like, you know, of course, you know, thousands and millions of people are gonna play my game, send me a couple of bucks a piece, you know, should definitely do that. As I said, not yeah. <laughs> not the best finance. You're already playing my business life. models at that yeah, young age. Yeah. Remember what language it was? What programming language? Was it basic? Uh, Pascal. Which, what? Pascal. Pascal. And they had a graphical component, so it's it not text-based. Yeah, 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 it was uh, like, uh, I think, you know, 300, 320 by 200, uh, whatever it was. I think the, kind of the earlier That's the resolution. VGA resolution, right? And I, I actually think the reason why this kind of company wanted to buy it is not like the fancy graphics or the mm -hmm. implementation. It was maybe the idea uh, of actual game. The idea of the game. Okay. <laughs> well, one of the things, I, 
it's so funny. I used to play this game called Golden Axe, and the simplicity of the graphics and something about the simplicity of the music, like it still haunts me. I don't know if that's a childhood thing. I don't know if that's the same thing for Call of Duty these days for young kids. Yeah. But I still think that the simple when the games are simple, that simple purity makes for like allows your imagination to take over and thereby creating a more magical experience. Like now with better and better graphics, it feels like your imagination doesn't get to uh, create worlds, which is kind of interesting. Um, it could be just an old man on a porch, like wa waving at kids these days that have no respect, but I still think that graphics almost get in the way of the experience. I don't know. Flip it bird. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if the imagination- Case closed. <laughs> case closed. I don't, yeah, but that that's more about games that, Op, like that's more like Tetris World, where they optimally, masterfully, like, create a fun short-term dopamine experience. Versus, I'm more referring to like role-playing games where there's like a story you can live in it for months or years. Um, like, uh, there's an Elder Scroll series, which is probably my favorite set of games. That was a magical experience, and that the graphics were terrible. The characters were all randomly generated, but they're, I don't know, that's, it pulls you in. There's a story, it's like an interactive version of an Elder Scrolls Tolkien world, and you get to live in it. I don't know, I miss it. It's one of the things that suck about being an adult is there's no, you, you have to live in the real world as opposed to the Elder Scrolls world. You know, whatever brings you joy, right? Minecraft, right? Minecraft is a great example. You create, like it's not the fancy graphics, but it's the creation of your own worlds. Yeah, that one is crazy. You know, one of the pitches for being a parent that people tell me is that you can like use the excuse of parenting to to go back into the video game world. And like, like that's like, you know, father, son, father, father, daughter time. But really you just get to play video games with your kids. So anyway, at that time, did you have any ridiculous ambitious dreams of where as a creator you might go as an engineer did you what, what did you think of yourself as as an engineer as a tinker or did you want to be like an astronaut or something like that <laughs> you know i'm tempted to make something up about you know robots uh yeah. engineering or you know mysteries of the universe but <laughs> that's not the actual memory that pops into my mind uh when you when you ask me about childhood dreams so i'll actually share the the, the real thing uh when I was maybe four or five years old, I, you know, as we all do, I, th I thought about you know what I wanted to do when I grow up, and I had this dream of being a traffic control cop. Uh, you know, they don't have those today, I think, but you know, back in the eighties and you know, in Russia, uh, you, you probably are familiar with that. Lex, they had these, uh, you know, police officers that would stand in the middle of an intersection all day, and they would have their like striped back, black and white batons that they would use to, you know, control the flow of traffic. And, you know, for whatever reasons, I was strangely infatuated with this whole process. And like that, that was my dream. Uh, that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. And, you know, my parents, uh, both physics profs, by the way, I think were, you know, a little concerned uh, with that level of ambition coming from their child yeah. uh, at you know, that age. Well, that it's an interesting, I don't know if you can relate, but I very much love that idea. I have a OCD nature that I think lends itself very close to the engineering mindset, which is you want to kind of optimize, you know, solve a problem by create, creating an automated solution, like a, like a, a set of rules, a set of rules you can follow, and then thereby make it ultra efficient. I don't know if that's, it was of that nature. I, I certainly have that. There's like fact, like SimCity and factory building games, all those kinds of things kind of speak to that engineering mindset. Or did you just like the uniform? I think it was more of the latter. I think it was the <laughs> uniform and the, you know, the, the striped baton there that made cars go in the right directions. <laughs> that, that, that drove me. But I guess, you know, I, it is, I did end up. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, working on the transportation industry <laughs> one way or another. No uniform, so, no, but. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So <laughs> less, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it was my, you know, deep inner infatuation with the, you know, traffic control batons that led to this uh, career. Okay, what, uh, when did you 
When was the leap from programming to robotics? That happened later. That was after grad school. Uh, after, and actually, the was self-driving cars was, I think, my first Robot. real hands-on introduction to robotics. But I, I never really had that much hands-on experience. And you know, school and training, I you know worked on applied math and physics. Then in you know college, I did more kind of uh, abstract uh, computer science. Uh, and it was after grad school that I really got involved in robotics, which was actually self-driving cars. And you know that was a big bit flip. What I, uh, what grad school? So I went to grad school in Michigan, and then I did a postdoc at Stanford, uh, which is. That was the postdoc where I got to play with self-driving cars. Yeah, so we'll return there. But let's go back to uh, to Moscow. So, I, I, you know, for episode 100, I talked to my dad. And also I grew up with my dad, I guess. <laughs> uh, so I, I had to put up with him for many years. And uh, he he went to the Fistiach, or MIPT. It's weird to say in English because I've heard all of this in Russian. Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. And to me, that was like, I met some super interesting, as a child, I met some super interesting characters. It felt to me like the greatest university in the world, the most elite university in the world. And just the the people that I met that came out of there were like, not only brilliant, but also special humans. It seems like that place really tested the soul. <laughs> Uh, both like in terms of technically and like spiritually. So that could be just the rom romanticization of that place. I'm not sure, but so maybe you can speak to it. But did, is it correct to say that you spent some time at Fistiach? Yeah, that's right, six years. Uh, I got my bachelor's and master's in uh, physics and math there. And it's actually interesting because my, my dad, and actually both my parents uh, went there. And I think all the stories that I heard, uh, like just like you, Alex, uh, growing up about the place and you know how interesting and special and you know magical it was, I think that was a significant, maybe the main reason uh, I wanted to go there uh, for college. Uh, enough so that I actually went back to Russia from the U.S., I graduated high school in the U.S. Um, and you went back there. I went back there. Yeah. That wow. Exactly the reaction most of my peers in college had, yeah, but you know, perhaps a little bit stronger. That like, you know, and point you, me out as were, this crazy kid. Who, were your parents supportive of that? Yeah. Yeah. Like you know, your previous question, they uh, they supported me and you know letting me kind of pursue my passions and the you know things that I That's was. That's a bold in. move. Wow. What was it like there? It was interesting. You know, definitely fairly hardcore on the fundamentals of you know math uh, and physics and uh, you know lots of good memories uh, from yeah you know, from those times so okay so stanford how would you get into autonomous vehicles i had the great fortune uh, and great honor to join stanford's darpa urban challenge team in uh, 2006 there this was a third in the sequence of the darpa challenges there were two grand challenges Prior to that, and then in 2007, they held the DARPA Urban Challenge. So, you know, I was doing my postdoc. I had I joined the team and uh, worked on motion planning uh, for you know, that that competition. So, okay, so for people who might not know, I know from from a certain <laughs> autonomous vehicles is a funny world. In a certain circle of people, everybody knows everything, and in a certain circle, uh, nobody knows anything. In, in terms of general public. So it's interesting, it's it's a good question what to talk about, but I do think that the Urban Challenge is worth revisiting. It's a fun little challenge, one that first of all, like sparked so much, so many incredible minds to focus on a, one of the hardest problems of our time in artificial intelligence. So that's, that's a success from a perspective of a single little challenge. But can you talk about like, what did the challenge involve? So were there pedestrians? Were there other cars? What was the goal? Uh, who was on the team? How long did it take? Like, any fun fun sort of specs? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So the way the, the challenge was constructed, and just a little bit of backgrounding, as I mentioned, this was the third uh, competition in that series. The first two were the grand challenge called the grand challenge. The goal there was to just drive in a completely static environment. You, know, you had to drive in a desert. Uh, that 
was very successful. So then DARPA followed with what they called the urban challenge, where the goal was to have you know build vehicles that could operate in more dynamic environments and you know share them with other vehicles. There were no pedestrians uh, there, but what DARPA did is they took over an abandoned Air Force base, uh, and it was kind of like a little fake city uh, that they built out there, and they had a bunch of. Uh, robots, uh, you know, cars uh, that were autonomous uh, in there all at the same time, uh, mixed in with other vehicles driven by professional uh, drivers. And each car uh, had a mission. And right? so there's a crude uh, map that they received uh, at the beginning, and they had a mission, you know, go you know, here and then there and over here. Um, and they kind of all were sharing this environment at the same time. They had interact, to interact with each other. They had to interact with the human drivers. So it's this very first, very rudimentary um, version of uh, a self-driving car that you know, could operate on, and on uh, in, a, in an environment you know, shared with other dynamic actors that, as you said, you know, really you know, many ways, you know, kickstarted this whole industry. Okay, so who was on the team and how'd you do? I forget. <laughs> uh, came in second. Uh, perhaps that was my contribution to the team. I think the Stanford <laughs> team came in first in the DARPA challenge, uh, but then I joined the team and, you know- we You were the with, one with the bug in the I, code. I, I mean, do you have sort of memories of some particularly challenging things or, you know, one of the cool things, it's not a, you know, this isn't a product, this isn't the thing that, uh, you know, it, there's, you have a little bit more freedom to experiment so you can take risks and there's, uh, so you can make mistakes. Uh, so is there interesting mistakes? Is there interesting challenges that stand out to you or some like taught you uh, a, a good technical lesson or a good philosophical lesson from that time? Yeah, uh, you know, definitely, definitely a very memorable time. Not really a challenge, but like a, one of the, most vivid memories that I have from the time. And I think that was actually one of the days that you know, really got me hooked uh, on this whole field was uh, the first time I got to run my software on the car. And uh, I was working on a part of our planning algorithm uh, that had to navigate in parking lots. So it was you know, something that you know, called free space uh, motion planning. So the very first version of that, uh, was, you know, we tried on the car. It was on Stanford's campus uh, in the middle of the night and you know, had this little you know, course constructed with cones uh, in the middle of a parking lot. So we we're there at like 3 a.m. You know, by the time we got the code to you know, uh, uh, you know, compile and turn over, uh, and you know, it drove. I could actually did something quite reasonable, and you know, it was of course very buggy at the time and had all kinds of problems, but it was pretty darn magical. I remember going back and you know. You know, later at night, trying to fall asleep and just you know being unable to fall asleep for you know the rest of the night, uh, just my mind was blown. <laughs> just like, and you know, that that that's what I've been you know doing ever since for you know, more than a decade. Uh, in terms of challenges and uh, you know some interesting memories, like on the day of the competition, uh, it was you know, pretty nerve wracking. Uh, I remember you know, standing there with Mike Montemarello, who was uh, the software lead and wrote most of the code. I think I did one little part of the planner. Mike, you know, incredibly did you know pretty much the rest of it uh, with, with you know, a bunch of other incredible people. But I remember standing on the day of the competition, uh, you know, watching the car you know, with Mike and you know, cars are uh, completely empty, right? They're all there lined up in the beginning of the race. And then, you know, DARPA sends them you know, uh, on their mission one by one. So then leave and like, you just, you know, they had these sirens, wow, wow, wow. they all had their different silence, silence, right? Each siren had its own personality, if you will. So, you know, off they go and you don't see them. You just kind of, and then every once in a while, they, you know, come a little bit closer to where uh, the audience is and you can kind of hear, you know, the sound of your car and, you know, it seems to be moving along so that, you know, it gives you hope. And then, you know, it goes away and you can't hear it for too long. You start getting anxious, right? So it's a little bit like, you know, sending your kids to college and like, you know, kind of you invested in them. You hope you, 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 you build it properly, but you know, it's, it's still uh, anxiety inducing. Uh, so that was uh, an incredibly uh, fun uh, few days. In terms of, you know, bugs, as you mentioned, you know, one, that, that was my bug that caused us the loss of the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, is there still uh, a debate that you know, I occasionally have with people on the CMU team? CMU came first, <laughs> I, sh I should mention. Uh, that CMU, uh, haven't heard of them, but yeah. Uh, it's some, you know, <laughs> it's little, a small school. school it's, 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 you know, it's really a glitch that, you know, they happen to succeed at something robotics related. Very scenic though. So <laughs> most people go there for the scenery. Um, yeah, That's right. it's a beautiful campus. <laughs> <laughs> 
I unlike, apologize. Unlike, unlike Stanford. So uh, for people, yeah, yeah, that's true, unlike Stanford. For people who don't know, CMU is one of the great robotics and sort of artificial intelligence universities in the world. CMU, Carnegie Mellon University. Okay, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> good, good PSA. So in the part that I contributed to, which was navigating parking lots and the way, you know, that part of the mission work is yeah, you, in a parking lot, you would get from DARPA an outline of the map. You basically get this, you know, giant polygon that defined the perimeter of the parking lot. Uh, and there would be an entrance and, you know, so maybe you know, multiple entrances or access to it. And then you would get a goal uh, within that open space, uh, X, Y, you know, heading where the car had to park. It had no information about the obstacles, so obstacles that the car might encounter there. So it had to navigate uh, kind of you know, completely free space uh, from the entrance to the parking lot into that parking space. And then uh, once it you know, parked there, it had to uh, exit the parking lot, you know, while of course encountering and reasoning about all the obstacles that it encounters in real time. So, uh, our interpretation, or at least my interpretation of the rules, was that you had to reverse out of the parking spot. And that's what our cars did, even if there's no obstacle in front. That's not what CMU's car did. And it just kind of drove right through. So there's still a debate. And of course, you know, if you stop and then reverse out and go out the different way, that costs you some time. And right? so there's still a debate whether, you know, it was my poor implementation that cost us extra time or whether it was, you know, CMU uh, violating an important was, rule of the competition. And, you know, I have my own uh, uh, opinion here. In terms of other bugs, and like, uh, I, I have to apologize to Mike Montemerla uh, you know, for sharing this on air, <laughs> but it is actually uh, one of the more memorable ones. Uh, and it's something that's kind of become a bit of a, a metaphor and a label in the industry uh, since then, I think, you know, at least in some circles, it's called the victory circle or victory lap. Um, and uh, it, our cars did that. So in one of the missions in the urban challenge, in one of the courses, uh, there was this big oval right by the start and finish of the race. So the ARPA had a lot of the missions would finish kind of in that same location. Uh, and it was pretty cool because you, you could see the cars come by, you know, kind of finish that part leg of the trip, that leg of the mission, and then, you know, go on and you know, finish the rest of it. Uh, and other vehicles would, you know, come hit their waypoint uh, and, you know, exit the oval and you know, off they would go. Yeah. Our car in the hand would hit the checkpoint and then it would do an extra lap around the oval and only then, you know, uh, leave and go on its merry way. So over the course of, you know, the full day, it accumulated uh, uh, some extra time. And the problem was that we had a bug where it wouldn't, you know, start reasoning about the next waypoint and plan a route to get to that next point until it hit a previous one. And in that particular case, by the time you hit the that, that one, it was too late for us to consider the next one and kind of make a lane change. So that every time it would do like an extra lap. So and it you know, came known as the, the Stanford victory lap. <laughs> the victory lap. Oh, that's there's, I feel like there's something philosophically profound in there somehow. But uh, I mean, ultimately, everybody is a winner in that kind of competition. And it, it led to sort of famously to the creation of um, Google self-driving car project and now Waymo. So can we uh, give an overview of, how was Waymo born? How was the Google self-driving car project born? What is the what is the mission? What is the hope? What is it is the engineering kind of uh, set of milestones that it seeks to accomplish? There's a lot of questions in there. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't but know. you're right. It, it, it kind of the DARPA urban challenge and the DARPA and previous DARPA grand challenges uh, kind of led, I think, to a very large you know degree to that next step. And then, you know, Larry and Sergey, um, uh, Larry Page and you know, Sergey Brin, uh, uh, Google Founders Court, you know, uh, saw that competition and you know, believed in the technology. So you know, the Google self-driving car project was born. You know. At that time, and we started in 2009, it was a you know, pretty small group of us, about a dozen people uh, who came together uh, to to work on, on this project at Google. At that time, we saw an, you know, that incredible early result in the DARPA Urban Challenge. I think we're all incredibly excited uh, about where we got to, and we believed in the future of the technology, but we still had a very... You know, rudimentary understanding of the problem space. So the first goal of this project in 2009 was to really better understand what we're up against. Uh, and you know, with that 
goal in mind when we started the project, we created a few milestones for ourselves uh, that maximized learnings, if you will. The, the two milestones were, you know, uh, one was to drive 100,000 miles in autonomous mode, which was at that time, you know, orders of magnitude that you know, uh, more than anybody has ever done. And the second milestone was to drive 10 routes. Uh, each one was 100 miles long. Uh, they were specifically chosen to be kind of extra spicy, you know, extra complicated and sample the full complexity right. of the, that, that, uh, domain, um, uh, and you had to drive each one from beginning to end with no intervention, no human intervention. So you would get to the beginning of the course, uh, you would you know, press the the button that would engage in autonomy, and you had to you know go for a hundred miles, you know, beginning to end uh, with no interventions. Um, and it, it sampled again the full complexity of driving conditions. Some uh, were on freeways. We had one route that went all through all the freeways and all the bridges in the Bay Area. You know, we had uh, some that went around Lake Tahoe and kind of mountainous uh, roads. We had some that drove through dense urban um, environments like in downtown Palo Alto and through San Francisco. So it was incredibly uh, interesting uh, to work on, and it uh, it took us just under two years, you know, just, uh, about a year and a half, a little bit more, to finish both of these milestones. And in that process, uh, you know, a it was an incredible amount of fun, probably the most fun I had in my professional you know, career. And you're just learning so much. You are, you know, the goal here is to learn and prototype. You're not yet starting to build a production system, yeah. right? So you just you were, you know, this is when you're kind of, you know, working 24 seven and you're know, hacking things together. And you also don't know how hard this is. I mean, that's the point. Like, so, I mean, that's an ambitious, if I put myself in that mindset, even still, that's a really ambitious set of goals. Like just those two, just picking, just picking 10 different difficult, spicy challenges, and then having zero interventions. So like not saying gradually we're going to like, uh, you know, over a period of 10 years, we're going to have a bunch of routes and gradually reduce the number of interventions, you know, with, that literally says like by, uh, as soon as possible, we wanna have zero and on hard roads. So, so like to me, if I was facing that, it's unclear that whether that takes two years or whether that takes 20 years. I mean, it, it took us be. under two. And I guess that that speaks to a really big difference between doing something once and having a prototype yeah. uh, where you are going after you know learning about the problem versus how you go about engineering a product that you know, where you, you know, look at. Uh, you know, you do properly do evaluation. You look at metrics. You you know drive down, and you're confident that you can do that. At home. And I guess that's the you know why it took uh, a dozen people, uh, you know. 16 months or a little bit more than that, uh, back in 2009 and 2010, you know, with the technology of you know the more than a decade ago, uh, that amount of time to achieve that milestone of you know, 10 routes, uh, 100 miles each, and no interventions, uh, and you know it took us a little bit longer to get to you know a full driverless product uh, that yes. customers use. That's another really important moment. Is there some? Memories of uh, technical lessons, or just one like, what did you learn about the problem of driving from that experience? I mean, we can we can now talk about like what you learned from modern day Waymo, but I feel like you may have learned some profound things in those early days, even more so because it feels like what Waymo is now is to trying to, you know, how to do scale, how to make sure you create a product, how to make sure it's like safety and all those things, which is all fascinating challenges. But like you were facing the more fundamental philosophical problem of driving in those early days. Like what the hell is driving as an autonomous, or maybe I'm again, romanticizing it, but is, <laughs> is, there, uh, is there some valuable lessons you picked up over there at the, those two years? Uh, a ton. The most important one is probably that we believe that it's doable, and we we've yeah. gotten uh, you know, far enough into the problem that uh, you know we, we had a, I think only a glimpse of the true complexity uh, of 
the, 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 the domain. You know, it's a little bit like, you know, climbing a mountain where you kind of, you know, see the next peak and you think that's kind of the summit, but then you get to that and you kind of see that, that this is just the, the start of the journey. Uh, but we've tried, we've sampled enough of the problem space and we've made enough rapid uh, success even you know with technology of 2009 2010 that uh, it gave us confidence to then you know pursue this uh, as a real product so okay so the next step you mentioned the the milestones that you had in the in, the, in those two years what are the next milestones that then led to the creation of Waymo and beyond yeah, we had a, a, it was a really interesting journey and you know Waymo came a little bit later uh, then you know the, we completed those milestones in 2010. Uh, that was the pivot when we decided to focus on actually building a product, you know, using this technology. Uh, the initial couple of years after that, we were focused on a freeway, you know, what you would call a driver assist, uh, maybe you know an L3 uh, driver assist uh, program. Then around 2013, we've learned enough. Uh, about the space and have thought you know, more deeply about you know the product that we wanted to build that we pivoted. Uh, we pivoted towards uh, this vision of you know building a driver uh, and deploying it fully driverless vehicles without a person, and that that's the path that we've been on since then. And uh, very, it was exactly the right decision for us. So there was a moment where you also considered like, what is the right trajectory here? What is the right role of automation in the in the task of driving? There was still, it, it wasn't from the early days obvious that you want to go fully autonomous. From the early days, it was not. I think it was in twenty around twenty thirteen, maybe uh, that we that became very clear, and we made that pivot, and it also became very clear, uh, and that it's you, the way you go building a driver assist system is you know fundamentally different from how you go building a fully driverless vehicle. So you know we've uh, pivoted uh, towards the latter, and that's what we've been working on ever since. And so that was around twenty thirteen. Then uh, there's a sequence of really uh, meaningful for us, really important uh, defining milestones since then. And uh, 2015, we uh, had our first, actually the world's first fully driverless uh, ride on uh, public roads. It was in a custom built vehicle that we had. You mm-hmm. must have seen those. We called them the Firefly, that, you know funny looking marshmallow looking thing. Um, and we uh, put uh, a passenger, uh, his name was Steve Mann, a you know, great uh, friend of our project from the early days. Uh, the, the, the man happens to be uh, blind. So we put him in that vehicle. Uh, the car had no steering wheel, no pedals. It was an uncontrolled environment. Um, you know, no you know, lead or chase cars, no police escorts. Um, and uh, you know, we did that trip a few times in Austin, Texas. So that was a, a really big milestone. Well, that was in Austin. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you know, we only, but at that time, we we're only. It, it took a tremendous amount of engineering. It took a tremendous amount of validation uh, to get to that point. Uh, but you know, we only did it a few times. We only did that. It was a fixed route. It was not kind of a controlled environment, but it was a, a fixed route, and we only did it a few times. Uh, then uh, in uh, 2016, uh, end of 2016, beginning of 2017 is uh, when we founded Waymo, uh, the company. That's when you know, we uh, kind of that was the next phase of the project where I wanted uh, we believed in kind of the commercial uh, vision of this technology, and it made sense to create an independent entity, you know, within that alphabet uh, umbrella to pursue uh, this product um, at scale. Uh, beyond that, in 2017, later in 2017, uh, was another really a huge step for us, really big milestone where we started, I think it was October of 2017, where when we uh, started regular uh, driverless operations on public roads, uh, that first day of operations we drove uh, in one day, in that first day, 100 miles in you know, driverless fashion. And then we've, you know, the, most, the most important thing about that milestone was not that you know, 100 miles in one day, but that it was the start of kind of regular ongoing driverless operations. And when you say driverless, it means no driver. That's exactly right. So on that first day, we actually had a mix and uh, uh, in some 
uh, we didn't want to like you know be on YouTube and Twitter that same day. So in uh, in, in many of the rides, we had somebody in the driver's seat, yeah. but they could not disengage. Like the car I got could you. not disengage. So uh, is- but in, in actually on that first day, uh, some of the miles were driven in just completely uh, empty I'm, driver's seat. I mean, this is the key distinction that I think people don't realize is, you know, that oftentimes when you talk about autonomous vehicles, you're, there's often a driver in the seat that's ready to, um, to take over uh, what, what's called a safety driver. And then Waymo is really one of the only companies, at least that I'm aware of, or at least as like boldly and carefully and all and all that is actually has cases. And now we'll talk about more and more where there's literally no driver. So that, that's another the, in the interesting case of where the driver is not supposed to disengage. That's like a nice middle ground. They're still there, but they're not supposed to disengage. But really, there's the case when there's no. Okay, there's something magical about there being nobody in the driver's seat. Like, just like to me, you mentioned um, the first time you wrote some uh, code for free space navigation of the parking lot. That was like a magical moment. To me just sort of an, as an observer of robots, the first magical moment is seeing an autonomous vehicle turn, like make a left turn, like apply sufficient torque to the steering wheel to where it, like there's a lot of rotation. And for some reason, and there's nobody in the driver's seat, for some reason that, that communicates that here's a being with power that makes a decision. There's something about like the steering wheel, because we, we perhaps romanticize the notion of the steering wheel. It's so essential to the, our conception, our 20th century conception of a car. And it turning the steering wheel with nobody in the driver's seat, that to me, I think maybe to others, it's really powerful. Like this thing is in control. And then there's this leap of trust that you give, like I'm gonna put my life in the hands of this thing that's in control. So in that sense, when there's no but no driver in the driver's seat, that's a magical moment for robots. So I I'm uh, I got a chance to uh, last year to take a ride in a, in a Waymo vehicle, and that that was the magical moment. There's like nobody in the driver's seat. It, it's it's like the little details. You would think it doesn't matter whether there's a driver or not, but like if if there's no driver and the steering wheel is turning on its own. I don't know. That's magical. It's it's absolutely magical. I I have taken many of these rides in a completely empty car. Yeah. No human in the car pulls up. Yeah. You know, you call it on your cell phone, it pulls up, it's you weird. get in, it takes you on its way. There's yeah. nobody uh in the car but you, right? That's something we call, you know, fully driverless you know, our uh rider only uh, mode of operation. Uh yeah, it, it it is magical. It is, you know, uh, transformative. This is what we hear from our uh, writers. It kind of really changes your experience, and not like that. That really is what unlocks the real potential of this technology. Uh, but you know, coming back to our journey, uh, you know, that was 2017 when we started uh, you know, truly driverless operations. And then in 2018, we've uh, launched our uh, public commercial service that we called Waymo One um, in Phoenix. Uh, in uh, 2019, we started offering truly driverless rider-only uh, rides to our uh, early rider population uh, of uh, users. And then uh, you know, 2020 has also been a pretty interesting year. Uh, one of the first ones, less about technology, but more about the maturing and the growth of uh, Waymo as a company. Uh, we raised our first uh, round of external financing uh, this year. You know, we were part of Alphabet, so obviously we have access to you know, significant resources. But as kind of on the journey of Waymo maturing as a company, it made sense for us to you know partially go externally uh, uh, in, in this round. So you know we raised uh, about three point two billion dollars uh, with from you know that round. Uh, we've also, you know, uh, started putting our fifth generation of our driver, our hardware uh, uh, that is on the new vehicle, but it's also a qualitatively different set of uh, self-driving hardware uh, that self uh, that uh, is now on the JLR pace. So that was a very important step for us. The hardware specs, fifth generation, 
I think it'd be fun to maybe, uh, I apologize if I'm interrupting, but uh, maybe talk about maybe the generations with a focus on what we're talking about in the fifth generation in terms of hardware specs, like what's on this car? Sure. So we separate out, you know, the actual car that we are driving from the self-driving hardware we put on it. Um, right now we have, so this is, as I mentioned, the fifth generation. You know, we've gone uh, through, we, we started you know, building our own hardware you know, many, many years ago. And uh, that you know, Firefly vehicle uh, also had the hardware suite that was mostly you know, designed, engineered, and built in-house. Uh, LiDARs are of one of the uh, more important uh, components that we design and build from the ground up. Uh, so on the fifth generation uh, of our uh, drivers uh, of our uh, self-driving hardware that we're uh, switching to right now, uh, we have, uh, as with previous generations, in terms of sensing, we have LiDARs, cameras, and radars. And we have a pretty beefy computer that processes all that information and makes you know, decisions in real time on, on board the car. Uh, so in all of the, and it, it's really a qualitative uh, jump forward in terms of the capabilities and you know, the various parameters and the specs of the hardware compared to what we had before and you know, compared to what you can kind of get off the, off the shelf in the market today. Meaning uh, from fifth to fourth or from fifth to first? Definitely from uh, first to fifth, but also from the, that was fourth, the from, world's uh, dumbest uh, question. De okay. Definitely, <laughs> no, uh, definitely from fourth to fifth. Okay, uh, gotcha. as well as uh, right. uh, this, that last step is a, is a big step forward. So everything's in house. So the, like lidar is built in house, and right. and cameras are built in house. I, you know, or it's different. You know, we work with partners. And there's some yeah. components uh, that you know we you know, get from our manufacturing and you know supply chain partners. Uh, what exactly is in house is a bit different. If you like, we we do a lot of you know custom uh, design on all uh, yeah. of our sensing models. There's lidars, radars, cameras. You know exactly. There's uh, lidars are. Yeah, almost you know, exclusively uh, in-house and some of the technologies that we have, some of the fundamental technologies there are completely unique uh, to Waymo. Uh, that is also largely true about radars and cameras. It's a little bit more of a, uh, a mix where, in terms of what we do ourselves versus what we get from uh, partners. Is there something uh, super sexy about the computer that you can mention that's not top secret? Like uh, <laughs> for people who enjoy computers for... I mean, uh, so you, there's there's a lot of uh, machine learning involved, but there's a lot of just basic compute. There's you have to uh, probably do a lot of signal processing on all the different sensors. You have to integrate everything. It has to be in real time. There's probably some kind of redundancy type of situation. Is there something interesting you can say about the computer for the people who love hardware? It does have all of the characteristics, all the properties that you just mentioned. Uh, redundancy. Uh, very beefy compute uh, for general processing as well as you know inference and ML models. It is some of the more sensitive stuff that you know I don't want to get into for IP reasons, but yeah, you know, it can we, we've shared a little bit uh, in terms of the specs of the sensors uh, that we have on the car. You know, we've actually shared you know, some videos of uh, what our lighter sees uh lighters see in the world mm -hmm. uh, we have 29 cameras we have you know, five lighters we have six radars uh, on these vehicles and you can kind of get a feel for the amount of data that they're producing that all has to be processed in real time uh to you know do perception to do complex reasoning so it kind of gives you some idea of how beefy those computers are but i don't want to get into specifics of exactly how we build them okay well let me try some more questions that you can't get into the specifics of like gpu wise is that something you can get into you know i know that google works with gpus and so on i mean for machine learning folks it's kind of interesting or is there no how do I ask it? Uh, I've been talking to people in the government about UFOs and they don't answer any questions. So this is this is how I feel right now asking about GPUs. <laughs> <laughs> but is there something interesting that you could reveal or is it just, you know, uh, it, or would leave it up to our imagination, some of, the, some of the compute? Is there any, I guess, is there any fun trickery? Like I, I talked to uh, Chris Latner for a second time and he was a key, a person about TPUs and there's a lot of fun stuff going on in Google in terms of uh, hardware that, that optimizes for machine learning. Is there something you can reveal in terms of how much 
you mentioned customization, how much customization there is for hardware for machine learning purposes. I'm going to be like that government, you know, you like, uh, uh, <laughs> person in the body of foes. Uh, okay. But I, I, you know, I, I, I guess I, you know, will say that it, it, it's, it's really compute is really important. Uh, we have very data hungry and compute hungry ML models kind of all over uh, our stack, and this is where you know both being you know, part of Alphabet as well as designing our own sensors and the entire hardware suite together, where on you know, one hand you get access to like really rich uh, raw sensor data that you can pipe from your sensors uh, 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 into your compute platform yeah, and build like build the whole pipe you know, from sensor, raw sensor data to the big compute as then have the massive compute to process all that data. Uh, this is where we're finding that uh, having a lot of control of that, that hardware part of the stack is really advantageous. One of the fascinating magical places to me, again, might not be able to speak to the details, but it is the it is the other compute, which is like, you know, this we're just talking about a single car, but the, you know, the driving experience is a source of a lot of fascinating data. And you have a huge amount of data coming in on the car on the car. And you know, the infrastructure of storing some of that data to then train or to analyze or so on. That's a fascinating like piece of it that that I understand a single car. I don't understand how you pull it all together in a nice way. Is that something that you could speak to in terms of the challenges of um, of seeing the network of cars and then bringing the data back and analyzing things that want that like, like edge cases of driving, be able to learn on them to improve the system, to to see where things went wrong, where th where things went right, and analyze all that kind of stuff. Is there something interesting there, in the from an engineering perspective? Oh, there's an incredible uh, amount of really interesting work that's happening there, um, both in the you know the real time operation of the fleet of cars and the information that they exchange with each other uh, in real time. Uh, to you know, make you know better decisions, as well uh, as on the kind of the offboard component, where you have to deal with massive amounts of data for you know, training your ML models, evaluating the ML models, uh, for you know simulating the entire system, and for you know evaluating your entire system. And this is where you know, being part of uh, Alphabet has been, once again been tremendously uh, advantageous. I think we consume an incredible amount of you know compute for ML infrastructure. Uh, we build a lot of custom frameworks to you know get good at you know, uh, you know on data mining uh, finding the interesting edge cases for training and for evaluation of the system uh, for uh, both training and evaluating some components and you know sub uh, parts of the system and various ml models as well as the uh, evaluating the entire system and simulation okay so that first piece that you mentioned yeah. that ca cars communicating to each other essentially I mean through perhaps through a centralized point but what uh, that's fascinating too. How much does that help you? Like if you imagine, like, you know, right now the number of way more vehicles is whatever, X. I don't know if you can talk to what that number is, but it's it's not in the hundreds of millions yet. And <laughs> imagine if the whole world is way more vehicles, uh, like that changes potentially the power of connectivity. Like the more cars you have, I guess actually, if you look at Phoenix, cause there's enough vehicles, uh, there's enough, when there's a, like some level of density, you can start to probably do some really interesting stuff with the fact that cars can negotiate, can be, uh, can communicate with each other and thereby make decisions. Is there something interesting there that, that you can talk to about like, how does that help with the driving problem from as compared to just a single car solving the driving problem by itself? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a spectrum. I uh, first I say that, yeah, it's it, it helps uh, and it helps in various ways, but it's not required uh, right now. The, the way we build our system, like each cars can operate independently, they can operate with no connectivity. Uh, so it, it, I think it is important that you know you have a fully uh, autonomous, you know, fully capable uh, driver uh, that you know computerized driver that each car has. Uh, then you know they do share information uh, and they share information in real time. It really really helps. Right? So the way we uh, 
do this today is, uh, you know, whenever one car uh, encounters something interesting in the world, whether it might be an accident or a new construction zone, that information immediately gets, uh, you know, uh, uploaded over the air and is propagated to the rest of the fleet. So, and that's kind of how we think about maps as uh, priors in terms of the knowledge of our uh, drivers, uh, of our fleet of drivers um, that is you know, distributed across the fleet right? and it's updated uh, in real time. So that, that's one use uh, case. Uh, you, know, you can imagine as the, you know, the, the density of these vehicles go up that they can exchange more information in terms of what they're planning to do uh, and uh, start uh, influencing how they interact with each other, uh, as well as you know, potentially sharing some observations right, to help with, you know, if you have enough density of these vehicles where you know one car might be seeing something that another is relevant to another car uh, that is very dynamic you know it's not part of kind of you're updating your static prior uh, of the map of the world but it's more of a dynamic information that could be relevant to the decisions that another car is making in real time so you can see them exchanging that information and you can build on that but again uh, I, I see that as uh, an advantage but it's you know not a requirement so what about the human in the loop so uh, when I got a chance to drive with uh, a ride in a, in a Waymo, uh, you know, there's customer service. <laughs> so like there is somebody that's able to uh, dynamically like tune in and uh, help you out. What uh, What role does the human play in that picture? That's a fascinating, like, you know, the idea of teleoperation, be able to remotely control a vehicle. So here, what we're talking about is like, like frictionless, uh, like a human being able to, in a in a frictionless way, sort of help you out. I don't know if they're able to actually control the vehicle. Is that something you could talk to? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, to be clear, we don't do teleoperation. Okay. I'm gonna believe in teleoperation for various reasons. That's not what we have in our cars. Uh, we do, as you mentioned, have you know version of you know customer support. Uh, you know, we call it life health. In fact, we find it that it's very uh, important for our rider experience, especially if it's your first trip. You've never been in a you know, fully driverless ride or only Waymo vehicle. You get in, there's nobody there. Right? So you can imagine having all kinds of you know questions in your head, like how this thing works. Uh, so we've put a lot of thought into yeah. kind of guiding our uh, uh, our riders, our customers through that experience, especially for the first time. They get some information on the phone uh, uh, if the fully driverless vehicle is used to service their trip. Uh, when you get into the car, we have an in-car you know, screen and audio that kind of guides them and explains uh, what to expect. Uh, they also have a button that they can push that will connect, connect them to you know, a real life human being that they can talk to all right, about this whole process. So that's one aspect of it. Um, there is, uh, you know, I should mention that there is uh, uh, another function that uh, humans provide uh, to our cars, but it's not teleoperation. You can think of it a little bit more like you know, fleet assistance, kind of like you know, traffic control uh, that, that you have, where our cars, again, they're responsible on their own for making all of the decisions, all of the driving decisions that don't require connectivity. They, you know, anything that is safety or latency critical uh, is done, you know, purely autonomously by onboard, uh, our onboard system. Uh, but there are situations where, you know, if connectivity is available uh, and a car encounters a particularly challenging situation, you can imagine like a super hairy uh, scene of an accident, uh, the cars will do their best. They will recognize that it's an off nominal situation. They will, you know, do their best to come up you know, with the right interpretation, the best course of action in that scenario. But if the connectivity is available, they can ask uh, for confirmation from, you know, here remote human um, uh, assistant to kind of confirm those actions and, you know, perhaps uh, provide a little bit of kind of contextual information and guidance. So October 8th was when you're talking about the, was Waymo launched the, the, the fully self, the public version of its fully, driverless, that's the right term, I think, service in Phoenix. Is that October 8th? That's right. Yeah, okay. It was the introduction of fully driverless rider-only vehicles into our you know, public Waymo One service. Okay, so that's that's amazing. So it's like anybody can get into a Waymo in Phoenix? Uh, that's right. Uh, so we uh, previously had uh, early 
uh, people in our early rider program uh, taking fully driverless rides in Phoenix. And uh, just uh, this uh, uh, a little while ago, we opened on October 8th, we opened that mode of operation to the public. So yeah, I can you know download the app and you know go on a ride. There is uh, a lot more demand right now uh, for that service <laughs> than we have capacity. Uh, so we're kind of uh, managing that, but that's exactly the way you described it. Yeah, well, that's interesting. So there's more demand than you can you can handle. Like what, um, what has been the uh, reception so far? Like what, I mean, okay. So, you know, that's, uh, this is a, a product, right? That's a whole nother discussion of like how compelling of a product it is. Great. But it's also like one of the most kind of transformational technologies of the 21st century. So there, it's also like a tourist attraction. <laughs> like it's fun to, you know, to, to be a part of it. So it'd be interesting to see like, what, what do people say? What do people uh, what what have been the feedback so far? You know, still early days, but so far the feedback has been uh, in, incredible, uh, incredibly positive. Uh, they, you know, we asked them for feedback during the ride. We asked them for feedback uh, after the ride uh, as part of their trip. We, you know, we asked them some questions. We asked them to, you know, rate the performance of our driver. Uh, most by far, you know, most of our drivers give us five stars <laughs> in our app, uh, which is uh, absolutely great to see. And you know, that's and we're, they're also giving us feedback on you know things we can improve. Uh, and you know, that's that's one of the main reasons we're doing this is Phoenix. And you know, over the last couple of years. And every day today, uh, we are just learning a tremendous amount of new stuff from our users. There's there's no substitute for you know, actually doing the real thing, actually having a fully driverless product uh, out there in the field with you know users uh, that are actually you know paying us money to get from point A to point B. So this is a, a legitimate like there's a paid service. That's right. And the idea is you use the app to go from point A to point B. And then what, what are the A's? What are the, what's the freedom of the, of the starting and ending places? It's an area of geography where that service is enabled. It's a you know, decent size of geography of territory. It's actually larger than, you know, than size of San Francisco. Uh, and, you know, within that you have you know, full freedom of you know selecting where you want to go you know of course there's some and you, you on your app uh, you get a map and you tell the car where you want to be picked up you know and where you want you know, you know the car to pull over and pick you up and then you tell it where you want to be dropped off all right and of course there's some exclusions right you want to be you know you, uh, where in terms of where the car is allowed to pull over right so you know that you can't do but you know besides that uh, it's amazing it's not like a fixed just would be very i guess i don't know maybe that's what's the question behind your question but it's not a you know preset set of uh yes you know, i guess it's, so within the geographic constraints with that within that area anywhere else it can be you can be picked up and dropped off anywhere that's right. And you know, people use them on like all kinds of trips. They we have and we have an incredible spectrum of riders. We, I think the youngest actually have car seats them and we have you know people taking their kids on rides. I think the youngest uh, riders we had on cars are you know one or two years old, you know, and the full spectrum of use cases. People you can take them to, you know, schools uh, to you know go grocery stop shopping, to restaurants, to bars, you know, run errands, you know, go shopping, et cetera, et cetera. You can go to your office, right? Uh, like the full spectrum of use cases. And uh, people you know, use them in their daily lives to get around. Uh, and we see all kinds of, you know, really in, uh, interesting uh, use cases. And that, that, that there's providing us incredibly valuable experience uh, that we then, you know, use to improve our product. So as somebody who's been on, done a few long rants, with Joe Rogan and others about the toxicity of the internet and the comments and the negativity in the comments. I'm fascinated by feedback. I, I believe that most people are good and kind and intelligent and can provide like uh, even in disagreement, really fascinating ideas. So on a product side, it's fascinating to me, like how do you get the richest possible user feedback like to improve? What's what are the channels that you use to measure? Because like you're you're no longer. That's one of the magical things about autonomous vehicles is it's not it like it's frictionless interaction with the human. So like you don't get to, you know, it's just giving a ride. So like how do you get feedback from people to in order to improve? 
Uh, yeah, uh, great question. Various mechanisms. Uh, so as part of the normal flow, we ask people for feedback. They, as the car is driving around, you know, we have on the phone and in the car, and we have a touchscreen uh, in the car, uh, you can actually click some buttons and provide uh, real-time feedback on how the car is doing. Uh, and how the car is handling a particular situation, you know, both positive and negative. Uh, so that's one channel. Uh, we have, as we discussed, customer support or life help, where you know, if a customer wants to you know, has a question uh, uh, or he has some sort of concern, they can talk to a person uh, in real time. So that that is another mechanism that gives us uh, feedback uh, at the end of a trip. You know, we also ask them how things went. They give us uh, comments and you know a star rating. And you know if it's, uh, we also you know ask them uh, to uh, uh, explain what you know went, went, went well and you know what could be improved. And uh, we we have uh, our, our writers are providing you know very rich uh, feedback. There you know, a lot a large fraction is uh, very passionate and very excited about this technology. So we get really good feedback. Uh, we also run uh, UXR studies, right? You know specific and uh, that are kind of more you know, go more in depth and we'll run both kind of uh, lateral and longitudinal studies um, where we have, you know, deeper engagement uh, with our customers. You know, we have our user experience research team. Tracking over time, that's what you mean by longitudinal, that's cool. That's, that's, right. that's exactly right. And, you know, that's another really valuable uh, feedback, uh, source of feedback. And you know, we're just covering a tremendous amount, right? Uh, people go grocery shopping and they like want to load, you know, 20 bags of groceries in our cars. And like, that, that's one workflow that you maybe don't, you know, think about, uh, kind of, you know, getting just right when you're building the driverless product. Uh, I have people like, you know, who, uh, bike as part of their trip. So they, you know, bike somewhere, then they get in our cars, they take a part of their bike, they load into our vehicle, then they go, and that, that's, you know, how they, you know, where we want to pull over and how that, you know, uh, get in and get out um, uh, process works, uh, provides us you know, very uh, useful feedback. In terms of, you know, what makes a good uh, pickup and drop-off location, uh, we get really valuable feedback. Yeah, and in fact, we had to um, uh, do some really interesting work with uh, high-definition maps and uh, thinking about walking directions. Right? If you imagine you're in a store, mm -hmm. right, in some giant space, and then you know you want to be picked up somewhere. Like you, if you just drop a pin at a current location, which is maybe in the middle of a shopping mall, like what's the best location for the car to come pick you up? And you can you know, have simple heuristics where you just kind of take your you know you clean in distance uh, and find the nearest uh, spot where the car can pull over that's closest to you. But oftentimes that's not the most convenient one. You know, I have many anecdotes where that heuristic <laughs> breaks in horrible ways. I, one example uh, that you know, I often mention is uh, somebody wanted to be you know uh, uh, dropped off uh, in Phoenix, uh, and you know we the car picked a location. Uh, that was close, the closest to there, you know, where the pin was dropped uh, on the map in terms of you know latitude and longitude. Uh, but it happened to be on the other side of a parking lot that had this row of cacti, and the poor person had to like walk all around the parking lot to get to where they wanted to be in 110 degree heat. So that you know that was a problem. So then you know we took all take all of these um, all of that feedback from our users and uh, incorporate it into our system and you know, improve it. Yeah, I feel like that's like requires AGI to solve the problem of like when you're, which is a very common case when you're in a big space of some kind, like apartment building, it doesn't matter, it's some, some large space. And then you call the like a Waymo from there, right? Like, so, and you, whatever, it doesn't matter, ride share vehicle. And like, at, where is the pin supposed to drop? I feel like that's, I, you don't think, I think that requires AGI. I'm gonna, <laughs> in order to solve. Okay, the alternative, which I think the Google search engine has taught is like, there's something really valuable about the perhaps slightly dumb answer, but a really powerful one, which is like, what was done in the past by others? Like, what was the choice made by others? That seems to be like in terms of Google search, when you have like billions of searches that you could, you could see which, like when they recommend what you might possibly mean, they suggest based on not some machine learning thing, which they also do, but like on what was successful for others in the past and finding a thing that they were happy with. Is that integrated at all with Waymo? Like what, what pickups worked for others? It is. I, I think you're exactly right. So there's uh, real, it's an interesting problem. Uh, naive solutions uh, have 
uh, uh, interesting failure modes. Uh, so there's definitely lots of things that you know, can be done to improve. Uh, and both learning from you know what works, what doesn't work, and actual heal from you know getting richer data and uh, getting more information about the environment and you know uh, uh, richer maps. Um, but you're absolutely right that there's something. I think there's some properties of solutions that, uh, in terms of the effect that they have on users, so much, 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 much better than others, right? And predictability right. and understandability is important. So you can have maybe something that is not quite as optimal, but is very natural and predictable uh, to the user and kind of works the same way uh, uh, all the time. And that matters. That matters. Matters uh, a lot for the user experience, and, and but you know to get to the basics, the pretty fundamental property is that the car actually arrives where you told it to arrive. Like you can always you know change it, see it on the map, and you can move it around if you don't it's, like it. And but like that property that the car actually shows up reliably on the pin yeah. is critical, which you know where uh, compared to some of the human uh, driven. Yes. Analogs, I think you know you you can have more predictability. It's actually uh, the fact uh, if if I have a, you know, I do a little bit of a detour here. Uh, I think the fact that it's you know your phone and the cars, two computers talking to each other, uh, can lead to some really interesting things we can do in terms of the user interfaces. You know, both in terms of function, uh, like the car actually shows up exactly where you told it uh, you want it to be, but also some you know really interesting things on the user interface. Right? As the car is driving, as you you know call it to, and it's on the way to come pick you up, and of course you get the position of the car and the route on the map, uh, but and they actually follow that route, of course. Uh, but it can also share some really interesting information about what it's doing. So, uh, and, and, you know, our cars, uh, as they are coming to pick you up, if it's come, if a car is coming up to a stop sign, it will actually show you that, like, it's there sitting because it's at a stop sign. Or a traffic light will show you that it's got, you know, sitting at a red light. So, you know, they're like little things, uh, right? Uh, but it, it, I find those little touch uh, touches uh, really interesting, really magical. And it's just, you know, little things like that that you can do to kind of delight your users. You know, this makes me think of... Um... There's some products that I just love. Like there's a there's a company called Rev, uh, Rev.com, where I like for this podcast, for example, I can just drag and drop a video and then they do all the captioning. Uh, it's humans doing the captioning, but they connect you, they, they automate, automate everything of connecting you to the humans and they do the captioning and transcription. It's all effortless. And it like, I remember when I first started using them, it was like, Life is good, like because it was so painful to to figure that out earlier. Uh, the same thing with uh, something called Isotope RX. This company I use for cleaning up audio, like the sound cleanup they do. It's like drag and drop, and it just cleans everything up very nicely. Uh, another experience like that I had with Amazon one click purchase. First time. I mean, uh, other places do that now, but just the effortlessness of purchasing, making it frictionless. It kind of communicates to me, like I'm a fan of design, I'm a fan of products, that you can just create a really pleasant experience. That the simplicity of it, the elegance, just makes you fall in love with it. So, I don't know, do you think about this kind of stuff? I mean, we've been, it's exactly what we've been talking about. It's like the little details that somehow make you fall in love with the product. Is that, we went from like urban challenge days where, <laughs> where love was not part of the conversation probably. <laughs> and to, to this point where there's a, where there's human beings and you want them to fall in love with the experience. Um, is that something you're trying to optimize for, trying to think about like, how do you, how do you create an experience that people love? Uh, absolutely. I think that's the vision is removing any friction or complexity from getting our users, our writers, to where they want to go. And so making that as simple as possible. And then, you know, beyond that, on, uh, just transportation, making, you know, things and, you know, goods get to their destination as seamlessly as possible. I right? talked about, you know, a drag and drop experience where I kind of express your intent and then, you know, it just magically happens. And for our writers, that's what we're trying to get to is you download an app and you, you know, click and car shows up. It's the same car. It's very predictable. It's you know, a, a safe and high quality experience. And then it gets you in a very reliable, very convenient 
uh, frictionless way to where you want to be. And along the journey, I think we also want to like, do little things to delight our, our users. Like the ride sharing companies, because they don't control the experience, I think, they can't make people fall in love necessarily with the experience. Or maybe they, they haven't put in the effort, but I, I think it, if I were to speak to the ride sharing experience I currently have, it's just very, it's just very convenient. But there's a lot of room for like falling in love with it. Like we, we can speak to sort of car companies. Car companies do this well. You can fall in love with a car, right? And be like a loyal car person, like whatever. Like I like badass hot rods, I guess 69 Corvette. And, and at this point, you know, you can't really, cars are so, owning a car is so 20th century, man. But is there something about the Waymo experience where you hope that people will fall in love with it? Because that, is that part of it? Or is it part of, is it just about making a convenient ride, not ride sharing, I don't know what the right term is, but just a convenient A to B autonomous tra um, transport? Or like, do you want them to fall in love with Waymo? So maybe elaborate a little bit. I mean, almost like from a business perspective, I'm curious, like how, do you want to be in the background invisible or do you want to be uh, like a source of joy that's in the, very much in the foreground? I want to provide the best, most enjoyable transportation solution. And, uh, and that means building it, building our product and building our service in a way that people do uh, kind of use in a very you know, seamless, frictionless way in their in their day to day lives. And I think that does mean, uh, you know, in some way falling in love uh, in that product, right? It just kind of becomes part of your routine. I, uh, it, it comes down in my mind to uh, safety, predictability of the experience and um, privacy thing, uh, aspects of it, right? So uh, our cars, uh, you get the same car, you get very predictable behavior, uh, and that that is important. And if you're gonna use it in your daily life. Uh, uh, privacy, I and mean, when you're in a car, you can do other things. You're spending a bunch, just another you know space where you're spending a significant part of your life, right? So not having to share it with uh, other people who you don't wanna share it with, I think is uh, uh, a very nice property. Uh, maybe you wanna you know, take a phone call or you know, do something else in the vehicle. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, safety on the quality of the driving, as well as the physical safety of, you know, not having some, you know, to share that ride uh, is, you know, uh, important to a lot of people. What about the idea that when, when there's a, somebody like a human driving and they do a rolling stop on a stop sign, like sometimes like, uh, you know, you get an Uber or Lyft or whatever, like human driver and, you know, they can be a little bit aggressive as, as drivers. It feels like there is um, not all aggression is bad. Uh, now that may be a wrong, again, 20th century conception of driving. Maybe it's possible to create a driving experience. Like if you're in the back, busy doing something, maybe aggression is not a good thing. It's a very different kind of experience perhaps, but it feels like in order to navigate this world, you need to, uh, how do I uh, phrase this? You need to kind of bend the rules a little bit, or at least like test the rules. I don't know what language politicians use to discuss this, but uh, <laughs> whatever language they use, you like flirt with the rules. I don't know, but like you, uh, you sort of, uh, have a bit of an aggressive way of driving that asserts your presence in this world, thereby making other vehicles and people respect your presence and thereby allowing you to sort of navigate through intersections in a timely fashion. I don't know if any of that made sense, but like how does that fit into the experience of driving autonomously? Is that makes a lot of sense. Well. This is you're hitting on a very important point of you know, uh, a number of behavioral components and um, you know uh, parameters that make your driving feel you know assertive and natural and comfortable, and predictable. Um, you know, our cars will follow rules. 
right? They will do the safest thing possible in all situations, let you know, be clear on that. Uh, but if you think of really, really, you know, good drivers, just, you know, think about, you know, professional limo drivers, right? They will follow the rules. They're very, very smooth, uh, and yet they're very efficient. Uh, and but they're they're assertive. Uh, they're comfortable for the people in the vehicle. They're predictable for the uh, other people outside the vehicle that they share the environment with. And that that's the kind of driver that we want to build. And you, just, you think if, you know, if uh, maybe there's a sport analogy there, right? You, know, you can do in you know, very many sports the you know, true professionals are very efficient in their movements, right? So they don't do like, you know, hectic uh, flailing, right? They're, you know, smooth and precise, right? And they get the best results. So that's the kind of driver that we want to build. In terms of, you know, aggressiveness, yeah, you can like, you know, roll through the stop signs, you can do crazy lane changes. Uh, typically doesn't get you to your destination faster. Typically not the safest or most predictable, uh, uh, or most comfortable thing to do. And, uh, but there is, uh, a way to do both, and that 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 that's what we're doing. We're trying to build a driver that is uh, safe, comfortable, smooth, and predictable. Yeah, that's a really interesting distinction. I think in the early days of autonomous vehicles, the vehicles felt cautious as opposed to efficient, and and still probably. But when I rode in the Waymo, I mean, there was it was it was quite assertive. <laughs> It moved pretty quickly. Like, um, yeah, that means one of the surprising feelings was that it actually, it went fast. And it didn't feel like awkwardly cautious that autonomous vehicle, like, like, so I've also programmed autonomous vehicles and everything I've ever built was felt awkwardly, e either overly aggressive, okay? Especially when it was my code, or uh, like, awkwardly cautious is the way I would put it. And Waymo's vehicle felt like uh, assertive and I think efficient is like a, the right terminology here. It, it wasn't, uh, and I also like the professional limo driver because we often think like, you know, an Uber driver or a bus driver or a taxi. This is what, the funny thing is, is people think like tra taxi drivers are professionals. <laughs> they, I mean, it's it's like that. That's like saying me, I'm a professional walker just because I've been walking all my life. I think there's an art to it, right? And if you take it seriously as an art form, then the, 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 there's a certain way that mastery looks like. And it's interesting to think about what does mastery look like in driving, and perhaps what we associate with like aggressiveness is unnecessary. Like it's not part of the experience of driving. It's like unnecessary fluff that uh, efficiency, you, could, you can be, you can create a good driving experience within the rules. That's, uh, I mean, you're the first person to tell me this. So it's, it's kind of interesting. I need to think about this, but that's exactly what it felt like with Waymo. I kind of had this intuition, maybe it's the Russian thing, I don't know, that you have to break the rules in life to get anywhere. <laughs> but maybe, maybe it's possible that that's not the case in driving. I have to think about that. But it certainly felt that way on the streets of Phoenix when I was there in, in Waymo. That, 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 that was a very pleasant experience and it wasn't frustrating in that like, come on, move already kind of feeling. It wasn't, it, that wasn't there. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, what, that's what we're going after. I don't think you have to pick one. I think truly good driving, it, gives you both efficiency, assertiveness, but also comfort and predictability and, you know, safety. Uh, and, you know, it's, that's what fundamental improvements in the core capabilities truly unlock. And you can kind of think of it as, you know, a precision and recall trade-off. You have certain capabilities of your model, and then it's very easy when, you know, you have some curve of precision and recall, you can move things around and can choose your operating point and you're trading off precision versus recall, false positives versus false negatives, right? But then, and, you know, you can tune things on that curve and be kind of more cautious or more aggressive, but then aggressive is bad or, you know, cautious is bad. But true capabilities come from actually moving the whole curve up, right? And then you are on kind of on a, on a very different plane of those trade-offs. And that that's what, you know, we're trying to do here is to move the whole curve up. Before I forget, let's talk about trucks a little bit. 
so I also got a chance to check out some of the Waymo tr- uh, trucks. Um, I'm not sure if uh, we want to go too much into that space, but it's a fascinating one. So maybe we can mention at least briefly. You know, Waymo is also now doing autonomous trucking, and uh, how different, like philosophically and technically, is that whole space of problems? It's one of our two big products and uh, you know commercial applications of our driver, right? Ride hailing and deliveries. You know, we have Waymo One and Waymo Via, moving people and moving goods. Uh, you know, trucking is an example of uh, moving goods. Uh, we've been uh, working on trucking since 2017. Uh, it is uh, a, a very interesting space. And your question of you know, how different is it? It has this really nice property that the first order challenges, like the science, the hard engineering, uh, whether it's you know hardware or you know onboard software or offboard software, all of the you know systems that you build for you know training your ML models for you know evaluating your time system, like those fundamentals carry over. Like the true challenges of you know, driving, perception, semantic understanding, prediction, decision making, planning, evaluation, uh, the simulator, ML infrastructure, those carry over. Like the data and the application and kind of the the, the, the uh, domains might be different, but the the the, the most difficult problems, uh, all of that carries over uh, between the domains. So that that that's very nice. So that's how we approach it. We're kind of uh, build investing in the core, the technical core, uh, and then there is specialization of and uh, uh, of that core technology to different product lines to different commercial applications. Uh, so on, you know, just to tease it apart a little bit, uh, on trucks, so starting with the hardware, the configuration of the sensors is different, right? They're, they're, they're different you know, physically, you know, geometrically, you know, different vehicles. Uh, so for example, we have two of our main laser uh, on the trucks on uh, yeah, both sides, so that we have you know don't have the blind spots. Uh, whereas on the JLR I pace, we have you know one of it uh, sitting at the very top. But the actual sensors are uh, almost the same, or largely uh, the same. So all, all of the investment uh, that uh, over the years we've put into building our custom lighters, custom radars, you know, pulling the whole system together, that carries over very nicely. Uh, then you know on the perception side, uh, the like the fundamental challenges. Of seeing, understanding the world, whether it's you know object detection, classification, you know tracking, semantic understanding, all of that carries over. You know, yes, there's some specialization when you're driving on freeways. Uh, you know, range uh, becomes more important. Uh, the domain is a little bit different, but again, the fundamentals carry over you know, very, very nicely. Uh, same, and you guess you get into prediction or decision making. Right, the fundamentals of what it takes to predict what other people are going to do, uh, to find the long tail, to improve your system in that long tail of you know, behavior prediction and response, that carries over, right? And so on and so on. So, the, I mean, that's pretty exciting. By the way, does uh, Waymo VIA include using the the smaller vehicles for transportation of goods? That's an interesting distinction. So I would say there's three interesting modes of operation. So one is moving humans, one is moving goods, and one is like moving nothing, zero occupancy, meaning like you're going to the destination. You, you're your empty vehicle. I mean, it's it's <laughs> the third is the less of a, if that's the entirety of it, it's the less you know exciting from the commercial perspective. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, in terms of like, if you think about what's inside a vehicle as it's moving, because it does, you know, some significant fraction of the vehicle's movement has to be empty. I mean, it's kind of fascinating, maybe just on that small point, is is there different control and like policies that are applied for a zero occupancy vehicle? So a vehicle with nothing in it, or is it just move as if there is a person inside? Well, it was with uh, some subtle differences. As a first order approximation, there are no differences. And if you think about you know safety and you know comfort and quality of driving, only part of it, it you know uh, has to do with the uh, you know the people or the goods inside of the vehicle, right? But you, you don't want to be you know you want to drive smoothly, and you know, as we discussed, not for the 
purely for the benefit of you know, whatever you have inside the car, right? It's also for the benefit of the you know people outside, kind of feeding, fitting uh, naturally and predictably into that whole environment, right? So you know, yes, there's some second order uh, things you can do. You can you know, change your route uh, and you know optimize maybe kind of your fleet uh, things at the fleet scale, uh, and you would take into account whether you know some of your cars uh, are actually you know, serving a useful trip, whether with people or with goods, whereas, you know, other cars are, you know, uh, driving completely empty, you know, to that next uh, valuable trip that they're going to provide. Um, but that those are mostly second order effects. Okay, cool. So Phoenix is, uh, is an incredible place. And what you've announced in Phoenix is, uh, it's kind of amazing. But, you know, that's just like one city. How do you take over the world? Uh, I mean, I'm asking for a friend. One, one, <laughs> one, one step at a time. Uh, one Pinky, step at a time. is that uh, the cartoon Pinky in the Brain? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, but you know, gradually is uh, a true answer. So I think the heart of your question is: Can you, know, can you, what, can you ask a better question than I asked? You're asking a great answer, question. Answer, answer I, that one. I, 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 I'm, I, you know, just gonna. You know, phrase it in the terms that I want to answer. answer perfect. This is exactly <laughs> right. Answer. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> Please. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, where are we today? And, you know, what happens next? Uh, and what does it take to go beyond Phoenix? And was it, what does it take uh, to get this technology to more places and more people around the world? Right. Um, so, our next big area of focus is exactly that uh, larger scale commercialization and just, you know scaling up uh, if I think about you know the main and you know Phoenix gives us that platform and gives us that foundation of upon which we can build and it's there are few really challenging aspects of this whole problem that you have to pull together in order to you know, build a technology, in order to you know, uh, deploy it uh, into the field, to go from a driverless car to a fleet of cars that are providing uh, a service, and then you know, all the way to you know, commercialization. So uh, and then, you know, this is what we have in Phoenix. We've taken the technology from uh, a, a proof point to an actual deployment, and have taken our driver, you know, from a, you, know, a, a, you know one car to a fleet that can provide a service. Um, beyond that, if I think about what it will take to scale up and you know deploy in you know more places with more customers, I tend to think about uh, three main. Uh, dimensions, three main axes um, of, of scale. One is the core technology, you know, the hardware and software, core capabilities of our driver. Uh, the second dimension is evaluation and deployment. And the third one is just the you know product, commercial, and operational excellence. So you can talk you know, uh, a bit about where we are along you know each one of those three dimensions, about where we are today and you know what has what will happen next um, on you know the core technology on you know the hardware and software uh, you know together uh, comprise a driver uh, we you know obviously have that foundation that is providing you know fully driverless trips to our customers as we speak uh, in fact uh, and we've learned a tremendous amount from that so now what we're doing is we are incorporating all those lessons into some pretty fundamental improvements in our core technology, both on the hardware side and on the software side, to build a more general, more robust solution that then will uh, enable us to massively scale you know, and be young Phoenix. So on the hardware uh, side, uh, all of those lessons are now incorporated into this fifth generation hardware platform that is you know, uh, being deployed right now. And that's the platform, the fourth generation, the thing that we have right now driving in Phoenix, it's good enough to operate, operate fully driverlessly, you know, night and day, you know, various speeds and various conditions. But the fifth generation is the platform upon which we want to go to massive scale. Uh, we 
it, in term, we've really made qualitative improvements in terms of the capability of the system, the simplicity of the architecture, the reliability of the redundancy. Um, uh, it is designed to be manufacturable at very large scale and you know provides the right unit economics. So that's that's the next big step for us um, on the hardware side. That's that's already there for scale, the version that's, five. That's right. And you, is that a coincidence or should we look into a conspiracy theory that it's the same version as the Pixel phone? <laughs> is that what's the hardware I that can you... neither confirm okay. nor deny, right. Lux. <laughs> All right, cool. So, sorry. So that's the, uh, okay, that's that axis. What else? Uh, so similarly, you know, the hardware is a very con- discrete jump, but you know, similar to the uh, that to how we're making that change from the fourth generation hardware to the fifth, we're making similar improvements on the software side to make it more you know, robust and more general and allow us to kind of, you know, quickly uh, scale beyond Phoenix. So that, that's that first dimension of core technology. The second dimension is evaluation and deployment. Now, how do you uh, measure your system? How do you evaluate it? How do you build the release and deployment process where you know, you, with confidence, you can you know, regularly release new versions of your driver into a fleet. Uh, how do you get good at it so that it is not, you know, a huge tax on your you know, researchers and engineers? That you know, so you can. How, how do you build all these, you know, processes, the frameworks, the simulation, the evaluation, the data science, the validation, so that you know people can focus on improving the system and kind of the releases uh, just go out the door and get deployed across the fleet. Uh, so we've gotten really good at that uh, in uh, Phoenix. That's been. A, tremendously difficult problem. Uh, but that's what we have uh, in Phoenix right now that gives us that foundation. And now we're working on kind of incorporating all the lessons that we've learned uh, to make it more efficient, to go to new places, you know, and scale up and just kind of, you know, stamp things out. Uh, so that's that second dimension of evaluation and deployment. And the third dimension is uh, product commercial and operational excellence, right? And again, Phoenix there uh, is providing uh, an incredibly valuable Platform, you know that's why we're doing things end to end in Phoenix. We're learning, as you know, we discussed uh, a little earlier today, a tremendous amount of really valuable lessons from our users, getting really incredible feedback, uh, and uh, we'll continue to iterate on that and incorporate all those uh, those lessons into making our product, you know, uh, even better and more convenient for our users. So you, you're converting this whole process of Phoenix in Phoenix into uh, something that could be copy and pasted elsewhere. So like, uh, perhaps you didn't think of it that way when you were doing the experimentation Phoenix, but so how long did, you basically, I mean, you can correct me, but you've, I mean, it's still early days, but you've taken the full journey in Phoenix, right? As you were saying, uh, of like what it takes to basically automate. I mean, it's not the entirety of Phoenix, right? But I imagine it, it can encompass the entirety of Phoenix at, at some point some uh, near-term date, but that's not even perhaps important, like as long as it's a large enough geographic area. So what, how copy pasteable is that process currently? And how, do, like, um, <laughs> you know, like when you copy and paste in in, uh, in Google Docs, I think, no, in, in or in Word, you can like apply source formatting or apply destination formatting. So how, when you copy and paste uh, the Phoenix into like say Boston, uh, how, how do you apply the destination formatting? Like how much of the core of the entire process of bringing an actual public transportation, autonomous transportation service to a city is there in Phoenix that you understand enough to copy and paste into Boston or wherever? Um, so we're not quite there yet. We're not at a point where we're kind of massively copy and pasting all over the place. Uh, but Phoenix, what you know, we did in Phoenix, and we very intentionally have chosen Phoenix as our you know, first full deployment uh, area, you know, exactly for that reason, to kind of tease the problem ap- apart, look at a- each dimension, you know, focus on the fundamentals of complexity and de-risking you know, those dimensions, and then bringing the entire thing together to get all the way uh, and you know, force ourselves to learn all those hard lessons on, you know, on technology, hardware and software, on the evaluation and deployment, on you know, operating a service, operating a business, using you know, uh, actually you know, um, uh, serving our customers, all the way so that we're fully informed about the most uh, 
difficult, most important challenges to get us to that next step of massive copy uh, and pasting, uh, mm -hmm. as uh, as you said. Uh, and uh, that's what we're doing right now. We're incorporating all those things that we learned into that next system that then will allow us to kind of copy and paste all over the place and to massively scale to you know more users and more locations. I mean, you know, just talked a little bit about you know what does that mean along those different dimensions. So on the hardware side, for example, again, it's that. Uh, switch from the fourth to the fifth generation. And the fifth generation is designed to kind of have that property. Can you say what other cities you're thinking about? Like I'm thinking about, sorry, we're in San Francisco now. I thought I want to move to San Francisco, but I'm thinking about moving to Austin. Um, I don't know why people are not being very nice about San Francisco currently. Maybe it's a small, It's like maybe it's in vogue right now. But uh, Austin seems, I visited there and it was, uh, I was in a Walmart. Uh, it's funny, these moments uh, like turn your life. There's this very nice woman with kind eyes, just like stopped and said, uh, you look so handsome in that tie, honey, to me. This has never happened to me in my life, but just the sweetness of this woman. It's something I've never experienced, certainly in the streets of Boston, but even in San Francisco where people wouldn't, that's just not how they speak or think. I don't know. There's a warmth to uh, to Austin that I love. And since Waymo does have a little bit of a history there, is that a possibility? <laughs> is this your version of asking the question of like, you know, Dimitri, I know you can't share your commercial and deployment roadmap, but, but I'm thinking about moving to should San I? Francisco of Austin, like, you know, blink twice if you think I should move to him. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. You got me. We, you know, we've been <laughs> testing in all over the place. I think we've been testing in more than you know, 25 cities. Uh, we drive in San Francisco. We drive in you know, Michigan for snow. Uh, we we are doing significant amount of testing in the Bay Area, including San Francisco. You which know, is I, not like, because we're talking about the very different thing, which is like a full on large geographic area public service. Uh, you you can't share. Any, okay. Thank you. <sighs> what about Moscow? Is that when is that happening? Take on uh, Yandex. I'm not paying attention to those folks. They're doing, <laughs> you know, there's there's a lot of fun. I mean, maybe that, that as a way of a question, you didn't speak to sort of like policy or like, is there tricky things with government and so on? Like, is there other friction that you've encountered except sort of technological friction of solving this very difficult problem? Is there other stuff that you have to overcome when when uh, deploying a public service in a city? That's interesting. It, it's very important. So we we put significant effort in uh, creating those partnerships and you know those relationships with governments at all levels, you know, local governments, municipalities, you know, state level, federal level. Uh, we've been engaged in very deep conversations from the earliest days of our, you know, uh, projects, uh, whenever, uh, at all of these levels, you know, whenever we go you know, to test uh, or, you know, operate in a new area, you know, we always lead with, you know, with a conversation uh, with the local officials. Um, and But the result of that, that investment is that, no, it's not challenges we have to overcome, it is, but it is a very important that we you know, continue to have this conversation. Oh, yeah, I love politicians too. Okay, uh, so Mr. Elon Musk said that uh, LIDAR is a crutch. What are your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't characterize it exactly that way. Uh, I know, I think LiDAR is uh, very important. Uh, it is a key sensor. Uh, that you know we use just like other modalities, right? As we discussed, our uh, cars use cameras, uh, lidars, and radars. Um, they are all very important. They are at the kind of the physical level. They are very different. They have very different, you know, physical characteristics. Uh, cameras are passive. Lidars and radars are active. They use different wavelengths. Uh, so that means they complement each other uh, and very nicely, and and, and they. Uh, together combined, they can be used to build a much uh, safer and much more capable system. So, you know, to me, it's more of a question 
you know, why the heck would you handicap yourself and not use one or more of those sensing modalities when they, you know, uh, undoubtedly just make your system uh, more capable and safer. Um, now, it, you know, what might make sense for one product uh, or one business might not make sense for another one. So if you're you know, talking about driver assist technologies, you make certain design decisions and you make certain trade-offs and you make different ones if you are you know, building a driver uh, that you uh, deploy in fully driverless uh, vehicles. Uh, and you know, in LiDAR specifically, when this question comes up, I uh, you know, typically the criticisms uh, that I hear uh, are you know, the uh, counterpoints that cost and aesthetics. And like I, I don't find either of those uh, honestly very compelling. So on the cost side, there's nothing fundamentally prohibitive about you know the cost of lighters. You know, radars used to be very expensive uh, before people started you know uh, before people made certain advances in technology and you know, started to, to, to manufacture them uh, at massive scale and deploy them in vehicles, right? Uh, so, you know, similar with lighters. And this is where the lighters that we have on our cars, especially the fifth generation, uh, you know, we've been able to make some pretty qualitative discontinuous jumps in terms of the fundamental technology that allow us to you know, manufacture those things at very uh, significant scale and at a fraction of the cost of you know, both our previous generation as well as a you know, fraction of the cost of you know, what might be available on the market you know, off the shelf right now. And you know, that improvement will continue. So I, I, I think you know, cost is uh, not a, a real issue. Uh, second one is uh, you know, uh, aesthetics. Uh, you know, I don't think that's you know a real issue either. Uh, Beauty is an eye of the beholder. You yeah, can make uh, a, you can make lidar sexy again. I think you're exactly right. I think it is sexy. Like honestly, I think form <laughs> yeah, I always all thought, its function. <laughs> well, and, okay. Uh, you know, I was actually somebody brought this up to me. Um, I mean, all forms of lidar, even uh, even like the ones that are like big, you can make look. I mean, uh, you can make look beautiful. Like uh, there's no sense in which you can't integrate it into design. Like uh, there's all kinds of awesome designs. I don't think small and humble is is beautiful. It could be like, you know, brutalism or like it could be uh, like harsh corners. I mean, like I said, like hot rods. Like I don't like, I don't necessarily like, like, oh man, I'm gonna start so much controversy with this. <laughs> I, I don't like Porsches, okay? The Porsche 911, like everyone says, oh, the most beautiful. No, it no, it's like it's like a baby car. It doesn't make any sense. But it, everyone, it's beauty's an eye at the beholder. You're already looking at me like, what is this kid talking about? <laughs> you're, I'm happy to talk about. You're you digging know, your own hole. The, the, the form and function and my take on the beauty of the hardware that we put on our vehicles. You know, I will not comment on, on the your, Porsche. Okay. You know, Porsche monologue. Okay. All right, so, but aesthetics, fine. But there's an underlying like philosophical question behind the kind of lighter question is like, how much of the problem can be solved with uh, computer vision, with uh, machine learning? So I think without sort of disagreements and so on, it's nice to put uh, it on a spectrum because Waymo is doing a lot of machine learning as well it's interesting to think how much of driving, if we look at five years, 10 years, 50 years down the road, what can be learned in almost more and more and more end-to-end -end way. If we look at what Tesla is doing with uh, as a machine learning problem, they're doing a multitask learning thing where it's just they break up driving into a bunch of learning tasks and they have one single neural network and they're just collecting huge amounts of data that's training that. I've recently hung out with George Hotz. I don't know if you know George. <laughs> uh, I, I love him so much. <laughs> he's just an entertaining human being. We were off mic talking about Hunter S. Thompson. He's he's the Hunter S. Thompson of autonomous driving. Okay, so he, I, I didn't realize this with Kama AI, but they're like really trying to do end to end. They're the machine, the mach like looking at the machine learning problem, they're uh, really not doing multitask learning, but it's, uh, it's it's computing the drivable area as a machine learning task and hoping that like l down the line this level two system that's driver assistance will eventually lead to uh, allowing you to have a fully autonomous vehicle. Okay, there's an underlying deep philosophical question there, technical question of 
how much of driving can be learned. So LiDAR is an effective tool today uh, for actually deploying a successful service in Phoenix, right? That's safe, that's reliable, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the the question, and I'm not saying you can't do machine learning on LiDAR, but the, the, the question is that like how much of driving can be learned eventually? Can we do fully autonomous that's learned? Yeah, uh, you know, learning is all over the place and uh, plays a key role in every part of our system. I, I, as you said, I would uh, you know, decouple the sensing modalities from the you know, ML and the software parts of it. Uh, LiDAR, radar, cameras, like it's all machine learning. Uh, all of the object detection classification, of course, like well, that, that's what you know, these uh, modern deep nets and cloud nets are very good at. You feed them raw data, massive amounts of raw data. Um, and you know, inf- uh, that's actually what our custom build lighters and radars are really good at. And radars, they don't just give you point estimates of you know, objects in space, they give you raw like physical observations. And then you take all of that raw information, you know, there's colors of the pixels, whether it's, you know, LIDAR's returns and some auxiliary information, it's not just distance, right? And, you know, angle and distance is much richer information that you get from those returns, plus really rich information from the radars. You fuse it all together and you feed it into those massive uh, ML models that then, uh, you know, uh, lead to the best results in terms of, you know, object uh, detection classification, you know, state estimation. So there's a, sorry to interrupt, but there is a fusion. I mean, that's something that people didn't do for a very long time, which is like at the sensor fusion level, I guess, like early on fusing the information together, whether so that the the sensory information that the vehicle receives from the different modalities or even from different cameras is combined before it is fed into the machine learning models. Uh, yeah, so I think this is one of the trends. You're seeing more of that. You mentioned end-to-end. There's different interpretation of end-to-end. There is kind of the purest interpretation of I'm going to like have one model that goes from raw sensor data to like you know steering torque and you know gas brakes. That you know that that's too much. I don't think that's the right way to do it. There's more you know smaller versions of end-to-end where you're you know, kind of doing. Uh, more end-to-end learning or core training or deep propagation of kind of signals uh, back and forth across the different stages of your system. There's you know really good ways. Uh, it gets into some you know, fairly complex design choices where on one hand you want modularity and decompositability, the composability of your system, uh, but on the other hand uh, you don't want to create interfaces that are too narrow or too brittle, uh, too engineered, where you're giving up on the generality of a solution, or you're unable to properly propagate signal, you know, rich signal forward and losses and, you know, uh, back, back so you can, you know, optimize the whole system jointly. Uh, so I would decouple, and I guess what you're seeing in terms of the fusion of the sensing data from different modalities, as well as kind of fusion at in the temporal level, going more from, you know, frame by frame, yeah, uh, where you know you would have one net that would do frame by frame detection in camera, and then you know something that does frame by frame in lidar, and then radar, and then you fuse it at, you know in a weaker engineered way later. Like the field over the last you know decade has been evolving in more kind of joint fusion, more end to end models that are you know solving some of these tasks you know jointly, and there's tremendous power in that. And you know that that's that's that that's the progression that you know, kind of our you know, uh, our stack has been on as well. Now, to your you know the, the, so I would decouple the kind of sensing and how that information is used from the role of ML in the entire stack. And you know I guess it's uh, I there's trade offs in uh, you know modularity and how do you inject uh, inductive bias into your system? Right, this is uh, there's tremendous power in being able to do that. So you know we have there's no Part of our system that is not heavily, uh, that does not heavily you know, leverage you know, data-driven development or you know, state of the art ML. But there's mapping, there's a simulator, or there's perception, you know, object level, you know, perception, whether it's semantic understanding, prediction, decision making, you know, so forth and so on. Um, it's and you know, of course object detection and classification, like you know, finding pedestrians and cars and cyclists and you know cones and signs and vegetation and being very good at estimating like, kind of detection classification and state estimation. There's just stable stakes, like like that's step zero of this whole stack. You can be incredibly good at that, whether you use cameras or light as a radar, but that's just you know that's stable stakes. That's just step zero. Beyond that, you get into the really interesting challenges of semantic understanding at the perception level. You get into scene level reasoning. You get into very deep problems. Uh, uh, that have to do with prediction and joint prediction and interaction, so on, interaction 
between all of the actors in the environment, pedestrians, cyclists, other cars, and you get into decision-making, right? So how do you build all those systems? So uh, we leverage ML very heavily in all of these components. I do believe that the best results uh, you achieve by kind of using a hybrid approach and having different types of ML, uh, having uh, different models with different degrees of inductive bias, that you can have, uh, and combining kind of model, you know, free approaches with some you know, model-based approaches and some uh, uh, rule-based, uh, physics-based uh, systems. So, you know, one example I can give you is traffic lights. Uh, the, there's problem of the detection of traffic light state, and obviously that's a great problem for you know computer vision. Confidence are you know, that's their bread and butter. Right, uh, that's how you build that. But then the interpretation of you know, uh, of a traffic light that you, you don't need to learn that, right? You, you, you read you don't need to build some you know complex ML model that you know infers with some you know precision and recall that red means stop. Like it was a it's a very clear engineered signal with very clear semantics. Yeah. Right. So you want to induce that bias. Like how you induce that bias and that whether you know it's a constraint or a cost you know, function in your stack, but like it is important to be able to inject that like clear semantic signal into your stack. And, you know, that's what we do. Um, and, but then the question of like, and, and that's when you apply it to yourself, when you are making decisions, whether you want to stop for a red light you know, or not. Uh, it, but if you think about how other people treat traffic lights, we're back to the ML version of that. Mm -hmm. Because like, you know they're supposed to stop for a red light, but that doesn't mean they will. So then you're back in the like very uh, heavy uh, ML domain where you're picking up on like very subtle cues about, you know, they have to do with the behavior of objects, and pedestrians, cyclists, cars, and the whole the, you know, the entire configuration of the scene that allow you to make accurate predictions on whether they will in fact stop or run a red light. So it sounds like already for Waymo, like machine learning is a huge part of the stack. So it's, it's a huge part of like, uh, not just, so obviously the, the first, the level zero or whatever you said, which is like just the object detection of things that, you know, with know that machine learning can do, but also starting to, to do prediction of behavior and so on to model the, what other, or the other parties in the scene, entities in the scene are gonna do. So machine learning is more and more uh, playing a role in that as well. Of course, when, oh, a a absolutely. I, I think we've been you know, going back to the you know, earliest days, like you know, DARPA, uh, even the DARPA Grand Challenge. Your team was leveraging, you know, machine learning. I was like pre, you know, ImageNet, and it was a very different type of ML. But uh, and then I think actually it was, it was before my time. But the Stanford team on during the Grand Challenge had a very interesting machine learned system that would, you know, use lidar and camera. Uh, when driving in the desert, and it we had you know, built the model uh, where it would kind of extend the range of free space reasoning. So we get a clear mm -hmm. signal from LiDAR, and then it had a model that said, hey, like this stuff in camera kind of sort of looks like this stuff in LiDAR, and I know this stuff in, that I'm seeing in LiDAR, I'm very confident that it's free space, so let me extend that uh, uh, free space zone into the camera range that would allow the vehicle to drive faster. Right? And then we've been building on top of that and kind of staying and pushing the state of the art in ML, uh, in all kinds of different ML uh, over the years. And in fact, uh, from the earlier days, I think you know, 2010 is probably the year where Google, uh, maybe 2011 probably, uh, uh, got you know, pretty heavily involved in uh, machine learning, uh, kind of deep nuts. Uh, and at that time, it was probably the only company that was you know, very heavily investing in kind of state-of-the-art ML and self-driving cars. Right? And they, 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 they go hand, you know, hand in hand. And we've been on that journey ever since. We're doing uh, pushing a lot of these areas uh, in terms of research, you know, at Waymo, and we collaborate very heavily with the researchers in Alphabet uh, and like all kinds of ML, you know, supervised ML, unsupervised ML. Uh, you know, we've you know, published some uh, interesting uh, research papers in the space, uh, especially recently. It's just a yeah, super super active, uh, as well. yeah, so super super active. Uh, and of course, there's you know kind of the more uh, mature stuff like, you know, confidence for, you know, object detection. But there's some really interesting, really active uh, work that's happening in um, kind of more, uh, you know, and bigger models and, you know, models that 
uh, have more structure uh, to them, uh, you know, not just you know, large uh, bitmaps and reason about temporal sequences. And uh, some of the interesting breakthroughs that you've, you know, we've seen in language models, right? You know, transformers, you know, you know GPT-3 you know, and friends. Uh, there's some really interesting applications of some of the core breakthroughs to those problems of, you know, behavior prediction, as well as, you know, decision-making and planning, right? You can think about it, kind of the, the behavior, uh, how, you know, the path, the trajectories, the, the how people drive, uh, they have kind of a share a lot of the fundamental structure, you know, this problem. There's, you know, sequential, you know, nature, there's a lot of structure uh, in this representation. There is a strong locality, kind of like in sentences, you know, words that follow each other, they're strongly connected, but there are also kind of larger context that doesn't have that locality. And you also see that in driving, right? What, you know, is happening in the scene as a whole has very strong implications on, uh, you know, the kind of the next step in that sequence where the, whether you're you know, predicting what other people are going to do, whether you're making your own decisions or whether in the simulator, you're building generative models of, you know, humans walking, cyclists riding, and other cars driving. Oh, that's that's all really fascinating. Like how it's fascinating to think that uh, transformer models and all the all the breakthroughs in language and NLP that might be applicable to like driving at the higher level at the behavioral level. That's kind of fascinating. Um, let me ask about pesky little creatures called pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, they seem so humans are a problem. If we can get rid of them, I would. Uh, but unfortunately, they're all sort of a source of joy and love and beauty. So let's keep them around. They're also our customers. Oh, for your perspective, yes, yes, for sure. Uh, <laughs> they're source of money. Very good. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't even know where I was going. Oh yes, pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, I, you know, th th they're a fascinating injection into the system of uh, uncertainty of. Um, of like a game theoretic dance of what to do. And, and also uh, they have perceptions of their own and they can tweet about your product. So you don't want to run them over <laughs> from that perspective. Uh, I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm joking a lot, but the, I think in seriousness, like, you know, pedestrians are a complicated uh, uh, computer vision problem, a co complicated behavioral problem. Is there something interesting you could say about what, what you've learned from a machine learning perspective, from also an autonomous vehicle and a product perspective about just interacting with the humans in this world? Yeah. Just, you know, to state on the record, we care deeply about the safety of pedestrians, you know, even the ones that don't have Twitter accounts. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, <laughs> all right, uh, all right but, cool. You know, uh, Not uh, me. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, yes, I, I'm glad I'm glad somebody does. Okay. Uh, but, you know, in all, uh, in all seriousness, uh, safety of uh, vulnerable road users, uh, you know, pedestrians or cyclists is one of our highest priorities. Uh, we do a tremendous amount of testing uh, and validation and put a very significant emphasis on you know the capabilities of our systems that have to do with safety around those unprotected vulnerable road users um you know cars just you know discussed earlier in phoenix we have completely empty cars completely driverless cars you know driving in this very large area uh and you know some people use them to you know go to school so they will drive through school zones right so uh kids uh, are kind of the, the very special class of those vulnerable user road users right you want to be you know super super safe uh, uh, and super super cautious around those so we take it very 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 seriously um and you know what does it take uh to uh be good at it uh you know, an incredible amount of uh, performance across your whole stack. You know, starts with hardware. Uh, and again, you want to use all sensing modalities available to you. Imagine driving on a residential road at night and kind of making a turn and you don't have, you know, headlights covering some part of the space and like, you know, a kid might run out. And, you know, lighters are amazing at that. Uh, they see just as well in complete darkness as they do during the day, right? So just, again, it gives you that extra, uh, uh, you know, margin in terms of, you know, capability and performance and safety and quality. Uh, and in fact, we oftentimes, uh, in these kinds of situations, we have our system detect something, in some cases, even earlier than our trained operators uh, in the car might do, right? especially in, you know, uh, in conditions like, you know, very dark nights. Um, so starts with sensing, then, you know, perception, has to be incredibly good. And you have to be very, very good at kind of detecting uh, pedestrians uh, 
in all kinds of situations, in all kinds of environments, including you know people in weird poses, uh, people kind of running uh, around and you know being partially occluded. Um, uh, so you know that that's step number one. Right? Then you have to have in very high accuracy and very low latency in terms of your reactions uh, to you know what you know these uh, actors might do, right? And we've put a tremendous amount of engineering and tremendous amount of validation into make sure our system performs uh, properly. And you know, oftentimes it does require a very strong reaction to do the safe thing. And you know, we actually see a lot of cases like that. That's the, the long tail of really rare, uh, you know, really uh, you know, crazy events uh, that um, contribute to the safety around pedestrians. Like one, one example that comes to mind that we actually that happened uh, in Phoenix where we were uh, driving uh, along and I think it was a 45 mile per hour road. So you know, pretty high speed traffic. And there was a sidewalk uh, next to it. And there was a cyclist on the sidewalk. And as uh, we were in the right lane, you know, right next to the side, uh, sidewalk, it was a multi-lane road. Uh, so as we got close uh, to the cyclist on the sidewalk, uh, it was a woman, you know, she tripped and fell. She just you know, fell right into the path of our vehicle. Right? Um, and our you know, car, uh, uh, you know, this was actually with a, a test driver, our test drivers uh, uh, did exactly the right thing. Uh, they kind of reacted and came to stop. It requires both very strong steering and a uh, you know, strong application of the brake. Uh, and then we simulated what our system would have done in that situation. And it did you know, exactly the same thing. It, uh, and that, that speaks to you know, all of those components of really good uh, state estimation and tracking. And you know, like imagine you know, a person on a bike and they're falling over and they're doing that right in front of you, right? So you have to be really like, things are changing. The appearance of that whole uh, thing is changing, right? And a person goes one way, they're falling on the road, they're you know, uh, being you know, flat on the ground in front of you. You know, the, the, the bike goes flying the other uh, direction. Like the two objects that used to be one are now you know, uh, are splitting apart and the car has to like detect all of that. Uh, and like milliseconds matter. And it doesn't, you know, it's not good enough to just brake. You have to like steer and brake and there's traffic around you. So like it all has to come together and it was really great. Uh, to see in this case and other cases like that uh, that we're actually seeing in the wild, that our system is you know performing exactly the way uh, that we would have liked and is able to you know avoid uh, collisions like this. It's such an exciting space for robotics, like in the in that split second to make decisions of life and death. I don't know, the stakes are high in a sense, but it's also beautiful that um, um, so for somebody who loves artificial intelligence, the possibility that an AI system might be able to save a human life. Uh, that's kind of exciting uh, as a as a problem, like to wake up. It gets, it's terrifying probably from an for an engineer to wake up and to think about, but it's also exciting because it's like, it's, it's in your hands. Let me try to ask a question that's often brought up about autonomous vehicles. And uh, it might be fun to see if you have anything, anything interesting to say, which is about the trolley problem. So uh, the trolley problem is a interesting philosophical construct of uh, that highlights, and many, there's many others like it, of the difficult ethical decisions that uh, we humans have before us in this complicated world. Uh, so the, specifically is the choice between if you were forced to choose uh, to kill a group X of people versus a group Y of people, like one person, if you didn't, if you did nothing, you would kill one person. But if you, you would kill five people, and if you decide to swerve out of the way, you would only kill one person. Do you do nothing, or you choose to do something? And you can construct all kinds of sort of ethical experiments of this kind. That uh, I, I think, at least on a positive note, inspire you to think about, like introspect, what are the the physics of our morality. And there's usually not good answers there. Uh, I think it, people love it because it's just an exciting thing to think about. I think people who build autonomous vehicles usually roll their eyes because uh, this is not, this one as constructed, this like literally never comes up in reality. You never have to choose between killing <laughs> one or like one of two groups of people. But I wonder if you can speak to, is there some something interesting to you as an engineer of autonomous vehicles that's within the trolley problem? Or maybe more generally, are there 
difficult ethical decisions that you find that uh, algorithm must make? On the specific version of the trolley problem, which one would you do if you're driving? The question itself is a profound question because we humans ourselves cannot answer it, and that's yeah. the very point. Uh, I, guess, I would kill uh, both. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, humans, uh, I think you're exactly right in that you know, humans are not particularly good. I think they kind of phrased as a, like, what would a computer do? But you know, humans you know, are not very good. And actually, oftentimes, I think that you know, freezing and kind of not doing anything because like you've taken a few extra milliseconds to just process and then you end up like doing the worst of the possible worst, outcomes, yeah. right? So um, I, I do think that uh, as you've pointed out, it can be a bit of a distraction and it can be a bit of a kind of red herring. I think it's an interesting philo- you know, discussion in the realm of uh, philosophy, um, right? But in terms of what, you know, how that affects the actual engineering uh, and deployment of self-driving vehicles, I um, it, it's not how you go about building a system, right? We've you know, talked about how you engineer a system, how you, you know, go about a Evaluating the different components and the you know the safety of the entire thing. How do you kind of inject the you know various model-based safety-based arguments? And you're like, yes, you reason at parts of the system. You know, you reason about the probability of a collision, the severity of that collision, right? Uh, and that is incorporated. And there's you know you have to properly reason about the uncertainty that flows through the system, right? So you know those uh, um, you know factors definitely play a role in how the cars then behave, but they tend to be more of like the emergent behavior. And what you, you see, like you're absolutely right, that these you know, clear uh, theoretical problems that they, you know, you, you don't encounter that uh, in the system. And really kind of being you know, back to our previous discussion of like, what, what, you know, what, what, you know, which one do you choose? Well, you know, oftentimes like, you made a mistake earlier. Like you shouldn't be in that situation uh, in the first place, right? And in reality, the system comes up. If you build a very good, safe, and capable driver, you have enough, uh, you know, clues uh, in the environment that you drive defensively, so you don't put yourself in that situation, right? And again, you know, it has, you know, this. If you go back to that analogy of, you know, precision and recall, like, okay, you can make a, tr- you know, very hard trade off of, you know, I, but like neither answer is really good. But what you know, instead you focus on is kind of moving the whole curve up and then you focus on building the right capability and the right defensive driving so that you know you don't put yourself in a situation like this i don't know if you have a good answer for this but people love it when i ask this question about <laughs> about books um are there books in um in your life that you've enjoyed philosophical fiction technical that had a big impact on you as an engineer or as a human being you know, everything from science fiction to a favorite textbook. Is there three books that stand out that you can think of? Uh, three books. So I would, uh, you know, that impacted me. Um, I would say, uh, uh, and this one is, you, you probably know it well, uh, but and not generally well known, I, I think in the U.S. or kind of internationally, The Master and Margarita. Uh, it's uh, uh, one of actually my favorite uh, books. Um, it is, you know, by a Russian, it's a, a novel by a Russian author, uh, Mikhail Bulgakov. And it's just, it, it's, it's a great book. You know, it's one of those books that you can like reread your entire life and it's, it's very accessible. <laughs> you can read it meaning. as a kid <laughs> and like, it's, yeah. it, you know, it's, a, the, the plot is interesting. It's, you know, the, the devil, you know, visiting the Soviet union and, you know, but it, it, it like you read it, reread it, uh, at different stages of your life and you, just, you know, it, you enjoy it for different, very different reasons and you keep finding like deeper and deeper meaning uh and you know it kind of affected you know had a definitely had an like imprint on me you know mostly from the uh, probably kind of the cultural stylistic uh aspect like it makes you th- one of those books that you know is, uh, is good and makes you think but also has like this really you know silly quirky dark sense of you know humor yeah, it captures uh, so. the russian soul That's more than many perhaps many other books on that like slight note just out of curiosity one of the saddest things is i've read that book in English, uh, did you by chance read it in English or in Russian? Uh, in Russian, only in Russian. Uh, and I, actually, that, that that is a question I had uh, uh, kind of posed to myself every once in a while. Like, I wonder how well it translates uh, if it translates at all. I and mean, there's the language aspect of it, and then there's the cultural aspect. So, I and actually, I'm not sure if you know either of those uh, would so yeah. work well in English. Now, I forget their names, but so when the COVID lifts a little bit, I'm traveling to Paris. Uh, for for several reasons, one is just I've never been to Paris. I want to go to Paris, but there's a the most famous translators 
of uh, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, of most of Russian literature live there. There's a couple, they're famous, uh, a man and a woman, and I'm gonna sort of have a series of conversations with them. And in preparation for that, I'm starting to read Dostoevsky in Russian. So I'm really embarrassed to say that I've read, this, everything I've read of Russian literature of like serious depth has been in English. Even though I, I can also read, I mean, obviously in Russian, but for some reason, it seemed uh, uh, in the optimization of life, it seemed the improper decision to do it, to read in Russian. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. like I don't need to, opt I need to think in English, not in Russian, but now I'm changing my mind on that. And so the question of how well it translates is a really fundamental one, like it, even with Dostoevsky. So from what I understand, Dostoevsky translates easier. Uh, uh, others don't as much. Obviously the poetry doesn't translate as well. I'm also the the music uh, big fan of Vladimir Vysotsky. He doesn't obviously translate well. People have tried, but Master Margaret, I, I don't know. I don't know about that one. Uh, I just know it in English, and it was fun fun as hell in English. So, uh, so, but it's a curious question, and I want to study it rigorously from both a machine learning aspect and also because I want to do a couple of interviews in Russia that. Um, I'm still unsure of how to properly conduct an interview across a language barrier. It's a fascinating question that ultimately communicates to an American audience. There's a few Russian people that I think are truly special human beings. And I feel like I sometimes encounter this with some incredible scientists and maybe you encounter this uh, as well at some point in your life that it feels like because of the language barrier, their ideas are lost to history. It's a sad thing. I think about like Chinese scientists or even authors that like, that we don't in an English speaking world don't get to appreciate some like the depth of the culture because it's lost in translation. And I feel like I would love to show that to the world. Like I'm, I'm just some idiot, but because I have this like at least some semblance of skill in speaking Russian. I feel like, and, and I know how to record stuff on a video camera. <laughs> I feel like I wanna catch like Grigory Perlman, who's a mathematician. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Mm -hmm. yeah, I wanna talk to him, like he's a fascinating mind and to bring him to a wider audience in English speaking, will be fascinating. But that requires to be rigorous about this question of how well uh, Bulgakov translates. I mean, I I know it's a it's a silly concept, but it's a fundamental one, because how do you translate? And that's the, that's the thing that uh, Google Translate is also facing. Yeah. Uh, as a as a more machine learning problem, but I I wonder as a more bigger problem for AI, how do we capture the magic that's there in the language? I I think that's a really interesting, really challenging problem. I if you do read it. Master and Margarita in uh, English, oh, sorry, in Russian. I'd be curious to you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. get your uh, opinion. And I think you know, part of it is language, but part of it's just you know, centuries of culture that you know, the, the, the cultures are different. So it's hard you know, to connect that. Uh, okay, so that was my first one, right? You had you know, two more. Um, the second one, I would you know, probably pick the science fiction by the Strogoski brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's up there with you know Isaac Asimov and you know Ray Bradbury uh, and you know company. Uh, the Strugatsky brothers kind of appealed more to me. I think more it made more of an impression on me uh, growing up. Um, I can remember, you can you? T I'm, I apologize uh, if I'm showing my complete ignorance. I'm so weak on sci-fi. What 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 do they write? Oh, um, uh, roadside picnic. Um, uh, hard to be a god. Uh, uh, beetle in an ant hill. Uh, Monday starts on Saturday. Like it, it, it's not just science fiction. It's also like has very interesting, you know, interpersonal and societal questions. And some of the language is just uh, completely hilarious. Uh, that's, that's right. the one. That's right. That's right. Oh, interesting. Monday starts right. on Saturday. Monday. So I need to read. Okay. Oh boy, you put that in the category of science fiction. Uh, that one is, I mean, this was more of a silly, you know, humorous uh, work. I mean, there is kind of- But know, it's profound too, right? It's science fiction, right? It's about, you know, this this research institute and like it's, it's, it, it, it has deep parallels to like serious 
in research, but the the setting, of course, is that they're working on you know magic, right? And there's okay. a lot of yeah. so I, I it, and that that's their style, right? They, they go you know, uh, and you know other books are you know, very different, right? You know, hard to be a god, right? It's about kind of this higher society being injected into this primitive world and how they operate there, like some of the very deep ethical you know questions there, uh, right? And like they've got this full spectrum. Some is you know more about kind of more uh, adventure style, but like I I enjoy all of their books. There's just you know, probably a couple Couple. Actually, one I think that they consider their most important work. Uh, I think it's the snail on a on a on a on a, on a hill. I don't know exactly how I'm sure how it translates. I tried reading a couple of times. I still don't get it. <laughs> but everything else I fully enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, and like for one of my birthdays as a kid, I got like their entire collection. Like occupied a giant shelf in my room. And then all like over the holidays, I just like you know my parents couldn't drag me out of the room, and I read the whole thing cover to cover. And it it uh, I you know, really enjoyed it. Uh, and that's the one more. I th- for the third one, I, you know, maybe a little bit darker, um, uh, but you know, comes to mind is Orwell's 1984. Uh, and I, you know, I, you asked uh, what made an impression on me and the books that people should read. That one I think falls in the category of both. Uh, you know, definitely is one of those books that you read and you just you know, kind of you know put it down and you stare in space for a while. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, that 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 kind of work. Uh, I I think there's you know lessons there people uh, should not ignore. And, you know, <laughs> nowadays with you know, like everything that's happening in the world, I like, can't help it, but, you know, have my mind jump to some, you know, parallels uh, with what Orwell described. And like this, this whole, you know, concept of double think and ignoring logic and, you know, holding completely contradictory opinions in your mind and not have that not bother you and, you know, sticking to the party line yeah. uh, at all costs. Like, you know, there, there, there's, there's something there. If anything, 2020 has taught me, and I'm a huge fan of Animal Farm, which is a kind of friendly, as a friend of 1984 yeah. by Orwell. It's kind of uh, another thought experiment of how our society may go in directions that uh, we wouldn't like it to go. But if if anything, it's been um, kind of heartbreaking to an optimist about 2020 is that that society is kind of fragile. Like we have this, it's, this is a special little experiment we have going on and not, it's not unbreakable. Like we should be careful to like preserve the, whatever the special thing we have going on. I mean, I think 1984 and, and these books, Brave New World, they, they're they helpful in thinking like stuff can go wrong in non-obvious ways. And it's like, it's up to us to preserve it. And it's like, it's a responsibility. It's been weighing heavy on me because like, for some reason, like uh, more than my mom follows me on Twitter. And I feel like I have, I have like now somehow a responsibility to um, to this world. And it, it, uh, it dawned on me that like me and millions of others are like the little ants that maintain this little colony. Right, so we have a responsibility not to be, uh, I don't know what the right analogy is, but uh, put a flamethrower to the place. We wanna not do that. <laughs> yeah. And there's interesting, complicated ways of doing that as 1984 shows. It could be through bureaucracy, it could be through incompetence, it could be through misinformation, it could be through division and toxicity. Uh, I'm a huge believer in like that love will be the somehow the solution, so. Uh, love and robots. <laughs> <laughs> love and robots. Yeah, no, I, I think you're exactly right. Unfortunately, I think it's uh, less of a flamethrower type of extra. I think it's more of a, in you know, many cases, can be more of a slow boil, right? and that that's the danger. Let me ask. Uh, it's a fun thing to make uh, a world class roboticist, engineer, and leader uncomfortable with a ridiculous question about life. Uh, what is the meaning of life, Dimitri? from a robotics and a human perspective. You only have a couple minutes or one minute to answer, so. <laughs> I don't know if that makes it more difficult or easier, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm very, very tempted to uh, quote uh, one of the stories stories by uh, uh, Isaac Asimov, actually. Um, actually titled, appropriately titled, The Last Question, uh, mm-hmm. a short story where, you know, the plot is that 
uh, you know, humans build this supercomputer, you know, this 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 AI intelligence, and you know, once it get par- gets powerful enough, they pose this question to it, you know, um, how can the entropy in the universe be reduced, right? So the you know, computer replies, hang on, as of yet, insufficient information to give a meaningful answer, right? <laughs> and then, you know, thousands of years go by and they keep posing the same question and the computer, you know, gets more and more powerful and keeps giving the same answer, you know, as of yet, insufficient information to give a meaningful answer or something along those lines, right? And then, you know, it keeps, you know, happening and happening. You fast forward like millions of years into the future and, you know, billions of years. And like at some point, it's just the only entity in the universe. It's like absorbed all humanity and all knowledge in the universe. And it like it keeps posing the same question to itself. And, you know, uh, finally it gets to the point where it is able to answer that question. But of course, at that point, you know, there's, you know, the heat death of the universe has occurred and that's the only entity and there's nobody else to provide that answer to. So the only thing it can do is to, you know, answered by demonstration. So it like, you know, recreates the Big Bang, right? And resets the clock, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but like, like, you know, uh, I, I, I can try to give kind of a, a, a different version of the answer. You know, maybe uh, not on the behalf of all humanity. I think that, that that might be a little presumptuous for me to speak about the meaning of life on the behalf of all humans. Uh, but at least, you know, personally, uh, it changes, right? I think if you think about kind of what uh, gives uh, you know, you and uh, your life, meaning and purpose, and kind of what drives you. Um, uh, it seems to change over time, right? And the the the, the that lifespan uh, of you know kind of your existence. Uh, you know, when just when you just enter this this world, right? It's all about kind of new experiences, right? You get like new smells, new sounds, new emotions, right? And like. That's what's driving you, right? You're experiencing new, amazing things, right? And that that's magical, right? That that's pretty, 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 pretty awesome, right? That gives you kind of meaning. Then you, know, you get a little, little bit older, you start more intentionally uh learning about things, right? I guess actually before you start intentionally learning, it's probably fun. Fun is a, a mm-hmm. thing that gives you kind of meaning and purpose and purpose and the thing you optimize for, right? Yeah. And like fun is good. Uh then you get, you know, start learning. And I guess that this this uh joy of Comprehension and discovery is another thing that you know gives you meaning and purpose and drives you, right? Then you know you learn enough stuff and it you want to give some of it back, right? And so impact and contributions back to you know technology or society, you know, uh, uh, people, uh, you know, local or more globally, you know, is becomes a new thing that you know drives a lot of kind of your behavior and you know, something that uh, gives you purpose and that you derive. You know, positive feedback from, right? You know, then you go and so on and so forth. You go through various stages of life. Uh, you know, uh, if you have, you know, if you um, have kids, uh, like that, definitely changes your perspective on things. You know, I have three. That definitely flips some bits in your head in terms of kind of what you care about and what you optimize for, and you know what matters, what doesn't matter, right? So you know, and so on and so forth, right? And I, I, it, it seems. To me, that you know, it's all of those things, and as as you kind of you go through life, um, you know, you want these to be additive, right? New experiences, fun, learning, impact. Like you want, you want to, you know, be accumulating. You know, I don't want to, you know, stop having fun or you know, experiencing new things. And I think it's important that you know, it just kind of becomes uh, additive as opposed to a replacement or subtraction. But you know. <laughs> those few is probably as far as I got, but you know, ask me in a few years, I might have one or two more to add to the list. And before you know it, time is up, just like it is for this conversation. Uh, but hopefully it was a fun ride. It was a huge honor, Dmitry. As, I, as you know, I've been a, a fan of yours and a fan of Google self-driving car and Waymo for a long time. I can't wait. I mean, it's one of the most exciting. If we look back in the 21st century, I truly believe it'll be one of the most exciting things we descendants of apes have created on this earth. So I'm a huge fan and I can't wait to see what you do next. Thanks so much for talking to me. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And it's a, also a huge fan doing <laughs> work, uh, honestly, like, uh, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Dmitry Dolgov. And thank you to our sponsors, Trial Labs, a company that helps businesses apply machine learning to solve real world problems. Blinkist, an app I use for reading through summaries of books, BetterHelp, online therapy with a licensed professional, and Cash App, the app I use to send money to friends. Please check out these sponsors in the description to get a discount and to support this podcast. If you enjoy this thing, subscribe on YouTube, 
review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, support on Patreon, or connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. And now, let me leave you with some words from Isaac Asimov. Science can amuse and fascinate us all, but it is engineering that changes the world. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.